before Dr. Umar comes out, we want to welcome you all to the House of Hathor, uh, the Hathor Cultural Arts Center. Uh, we've been here in uh, the Greenview Plaza for about three years now, or be three years in February. And this is one of the things that our Cultural Arts Center wanted to be able to do is to bring people to our community, to our community, that can uplift us, encourage us, inspire us, invest in us, and in being inviting to us so that we can gain enlightenment and be the true attributes and vessels that we're supposed to be for our families and for our communities. So we ask that you take part in the experience that we're, that we're giving you today and bring, take some jewels back with you that can help you with your families as well as with your communities. Don't let this be a feel-good moment for you. Don't let this be just words that hit empty ears or a dead head. Let it be something that can uplift you and be true to your heart and your mind, your soul, your spirit. Let the ancestors, let them know that we appreciate what they're bringing to us so that we can rid ourselves from this Babylonian instincts that, that's been placed in us. Okay? So Dr. Umar Johnson is going to bring us some words. He's going to bring us some thoughts that we can commit ourselves to and let our intentions be the true light that shines within us. Okay? Because that is the one thing that our ancestors gave to all of us, our intentions. That is the only pure thing that we have. And so those intentions, let's bring them forward. Let the words that he give us be intentional. Let the words that he give us be a part of what the ancestors have given him to give to us. He is a messenger, a true messenger for us. And so we want to receive it. We want to utilize it. And we want to make sure that we can manifest from that. So I give thanks to you all for being here today. And with no further ado, I'm going to bring forth Dr. Umar Johnson. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's an honor to be here in Columbia, South Carolina. Before we go any further, let us first thank Baba Rotoski and his beautiful queen for allowing us to be here today. Please give him a round of applause. I also want to acknowledge Queen Mother G, who was the first and only previous uh, host of Dr. Umar in Columbia, South Carolina. Where are you, Mama G? Right over here. Give her a hand. <laughs> so only my second visit in your town, and actually the first to actually address everyone openly. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Umar Johnson, and I am a doctor of clinical psychology a doctorate that I earned from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine about a decade ago. I'm also a certified school psychologist, something I've been doing for 20 years now, studying for about a quarter of a century. I'm also a Pan-Africanist, former Minister of Education for Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, Association and African Communities League, which is the largest black organization in modern history, the only mass movement to be organized without the use or exploitation of a religion. And it is the organization that gave us the red, black, and green flag. So today I'm going to talk about politics because I'm trained in political science, but I'm also going to talk about pan-Africanism. But the biggest contextual conversation we need to have today is the miseducation of our children, which is the primary reason why I'm here because I am the only school psychologist in the black conscious community, and I'm probably the only psychologist in the United States of America of our race who teaches black parents plainly and openly what the school is doing and how they are doing it. So let's start there. Let's start with that, the psychological and educational exploitation of black children. First and foremost, before we get started, are there any sisters in the back who need a seat? Because if you need a seat, there will be a brother who will vacate his. So raise your hand, ladies, if you need a seat. Any sisters in the back standing who would like to sit? Don't be ashamed. Are you sure? Jesus. All right. So let's deal with this demon called special education. Let's start with that. So special education came to us in 1975 by an act of the United States Congress. And I don't have a problem with you taping unless Baba does. Go right ahead. So, unless you're a coon or a hater, then put the phone down. Now, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> okay? So, special ed comes to us in 1975 by an act of U.S. Congress, Public Law 94-142, which was the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. Now, let me be clear. The reason we got special ed in 75 
is because the Supreme Court outlawed school desegregation in 54. The 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision that no school district, even now, 50 some odd years later, has followed. Nonetheless, it was that law that gave birth to special ed. Why? Because white folks needed a s excuse, a justification to resegregate black children from white children in the post Jim Crow era, and they could no longer use race. So if I want to get black kids out of the same class with my white children, how can I do that if I'm not allowed to use race? The learning disability became the new scapegoat. The learning disability replaced race as the justification, as the excuse for why and how white school districts all across America would in fact keep black children separate. Which is why you cannot prove a learning disability because it's not scientific. The learning disability is a social construct. They made it up to justify resegregation of the children. Well, what do you mean by that, Dr. Umar? My son has a learning disability in reading. He has an IEP for it. My daughter has a learning disability for math. She has an IEP for it. My grandson has an emotional disturbance. He has an IEP for it. My granddaughter has an intellectual disability. She has an IEP for it. But let me ask you a real simple question. How can you prove to me that that child is reading disabled? Because the psychological evaluation did not prove that. How can you prove to me that that child was math disabled or reading disabled, intellectually disabled or emotionally disturbed? You cannot prove it. The psychological evaluation does not prove the child was learning disabled. The only thing the psychological evaluation proved was that the person conducting the evaluation believed the child was learning disabled. See, when we bring your child into the office, a desk just like this, I'm sitting on this side as the evaluating certified school psychologist. Your child is sitting over there. I'm going to give your child an intelligence test, reading test, writing test, math test, listening test, speaking test. I'm going to give them a visual motor screening, an adaptive behavior measure, some form of an emotional assessment, some form of a psychological screener. I'm going to observe him in the class. I'm going to talk to his mother. I'm going to talk to the teacher. I'm going to talk to the father. I'm going to review his records, his test scores, his attendance, his discipline, his special ed file, his report card grades, his South Carolina State achievement test scores. But everything I just discussed only gives me a score. Nothing I just discussed produces a diagnosis. So number one, I want all y'all to understand that no test diagnoses children. Some of y'all think you take your child in and give them a reading disability test or ADHD test. There's no such thing. The tests only give us scores. It is the human being that decides if the child is learning disabled. I want to be clear about that. And most children go to special ed for what? Reading problems. Why is that? Because whole language has replaced phonics as the primary mode of reading instruction. So our children are not taught how to read as well as we did. And that's why the special ed rates are up through the roof. Then there's 13 special ed categories. There's speech and language impairments, there's autism, there's the specific learning disability, which includes your reading, writing, math, listening, speaking. There's your intellectual disability, there's your other health impairment for things such as ADHD. There's your blindness, your deafness, your brain injury, your developmental delay, your orthopedic impairment, your multiple disability, your children who are both blind and deaf. But of those 13, the reading disability is by far the largest reason why black children are in special education is reading. And although I do blame the school for poorly teaching our children how to read, I blame you even more. And the reason I blame black people even more is we are the only ones who have to live with the consequences of bad decisions that are made on behalf of our children. And some of you are extremely docile when it comes to letting white folk decide what's best for your child. Failing to realize that you're the only one who has to live with the consequences of the poor decisions. They will be in that elementary school five years, six years, maybe eight. They will be in that high school three years or four years. But once they leave that school, that principal will never see your child or think about them ever again. Same thing with the counselor, the nurse, the psychologist, the classroom teacher. Your child only belongs to them for a season. They belong to you for a lifetime. But yet and still, you keep on letting these white folks and the coons who work with them make decisions about your children that will be disastrous for their future. Understand something. Most black men in jail 
read on the fourth grade level. Most black boys will be referred for special ed in the fourth grade. There's two million black people in prison. There's two million black children in special education. Special ed is the school to prison pipeline. If your child got a reading problem, the best thing you can do is give your child a tutor, not no IEP. Because the longer your child stays in special ed, the worse off they'll become. What do you mean by that? Put a fifth grader in special ed because they're reading on the third grade level. By the time they get to the ninth grade, they'll be reading on the fifth grade level. Now they're four grades behind. And then when they get to the ninth grade, they'll be reading on the sixth grade level. When they get to the eleventh grade, they'll be reading on the sixth grade level. Now they're five grades behind. The gap gets wider between your children and other children their age the longer they get in special ed. Why does the gap grow? Because how are you going to catch up going slower? <clears throat> special education is dumbed down education. And most of the time our children don't have a problem learning. Excuse me. They don't have a problem learning the skill of reading or math. Their issue is motivation and interest. In fact, most black children in special ed are not there for skills problems. They're there for motivational issues. And that comes directly from your home. See, the real LD in the black community is not the learning disability. The learning disability is not the real LD. The real LD in the black community is the lazy disability. Your children have lazy disabilities. That's what they have. Raheem can learn how to read. He's not interested. Shaquita can learn how to do math. She's not interested. Raheem is going to be a football or basketball player, or so he thinks. Because nobody bothered to tell that boy that you have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than you do of becoming a professional athlete. Shaquita wants to be the next Cardi B or Megan Thee Stallion. And nobody told her that the chances of her making it big in music and living comfortable enough off of it to never need another job in her life are also much lower than it is her risk to be struck by lightning. We are letting our children grow up with fantasies instead of goals. We are letting our children grow up with fantasies instead of plans. And we can talk about the miseducation machine all day, but I'm willing to bet you if I go into your homes, I won't see a bookshelf in most of them. I won't see a dictionary in most of them. I won't see a thesaurus in most of them. And I won't see a complete set of encyclopedia in most of them. But I'll see fake hair. I'll see Air Jordans. I'll see big TVs, laptops, video games. I mean, after all, what are we about to do the week after next? Not me, but you all. You're about to run out and take every penny you saved this year and give it to white folks in the name of Christmas, which ain't got nothing to do with Jesus the Christ at all. But you've been so induced by the white power structure, they manipulated your love for God into an economic holiday for themselves. And so now you go and waste all your money on buying gifts that neither you nor your child will be bothered with Two weeks after Christmas. And yet we go back and we complain about racism, but we keep on financially empowering it every Christmas. And I'm trying to understand for the life of me, why are there video game units in homes with kids not even reading on grade level? If your son got an IEP, if he ain't got straight A's and B's, if he's in special ed, what is he doing with a video game unit in the house? He got time to spend three, four, five hours a day playing games, but he ain't got no time to read books or study. See, if it was up to me, we wouldn't diagnose the children. We would diagnose the homes they come from. If it was up to me, we wouldn't diagnose the babies. We would diagnose the mothers and fathers because there would be no learning disability if it didn't start in your home. There would be no special ed if it didn't start in your home. I can't remember the last time I went into a black house where they had a quiet hour, where everyone in the home, parent and child, was expected to read. We don't do that no more. Ain't no quiet hour in our house. In fact, most black homes, you go into them. There's no space where you can go Focus, study, or even think that isn't polluted with TV or radio or video game or cell phone or somebody running their mouth. No quiet place to operate. Your house is nothing but a prison preparation laboratory. And then you get mad when they end up in jail. When you set the groundwork and the foundation for it to happen. We know what white folks are about. They've been consistent for a thousand years. You can't even blame them no more because they are consistent. The problem is you are inconsistent in your response to what they do. It makes no sense that African people in this country are a $2 trillion industry. $2 trillion. Richest group of Africans in the world, 10th richest economic nation on the planet Earth, and yet nowhere can I go in this country. 50 states and 50 million Africans. Nowhere in 50 states and 50 million Africans. That's a million blacks for every state 
And nowhere can I go and find an independent black community. Nowhere. That's sad. I find Chinese ones. Arabs got theirs. Mexicans got theirs. East Indians got theirs. Native Americans got theirs. As long as we've been here, we still don't have an independent community. And what is the basis of an independent community? A school to teach the children, a hospital to save the children, a supermarket to feed the children, and a bank to invest in the children. Those are the four essential institutions of an independent community, and we ain't got them nowhere. Black people once owned in the United States over 500 hospitals. Over 500 independently black-owned and operated hospitals. You can hardly find one now. One thing slavery did to us was it took from us, it killed the natural desire that we once had to control our own destiny. Everybody else still has that. That's why when Chinese show up in Colombia, the first thing Chinese do is build Chinese communities. When Arabs show up in Colombia, the first thing they do is they build communities. When you see Mexicans and other groups show up, I don't care if they're in Charleston, I don't care if they're in Rock Hill, I don't care if they right here, wherever you find them, Newberry, wherever you go, they build community, a place to call their own. Black people are the only non-white people in this country who are allergic to accumulating power. You don't want power. You know when we come together, you know what we usually talk about? How we can participate in other people's power dynamic. Most of our conversations are about inclusion, not independence. Most of our conversations are about how can I participate, not how can I take over. European Jews, you think they come together to find out how they can participate with Negroes? You think Chinese are concerned about participating with Indians? When the last time you seen a Chinese in an East Indian shop, and when is the last time you seen an Indian in a Chinese shop? You don't! Because they are culturally self-sufficient. We are the only people who are not culturally self-sufficient, and religion is a big part of that. Because religion switched out culture for beliefs. And the foundation of all black religion, I don't care if you are African traditionalist, and I am, but I got issues with the fact that we initiate white folks to be priests and priestesses of traditional African spiritual systems. That's insane. One of the reasons African people don't get respect anywhere in the world is nothing is sacred to African people anymore. There is nothing you have that a non-African cannot touch. And if I'm wrong, name it. Nothing. There's no church that a non-African can't touch. There's no shrine that a non-African can't touch. There's no cultural product that a non-African can't exploit. Think about it. There's no religion they cannot belong to. Every non-African in the world can touch anything that you make. Nothing sacred. That's why McDonald's is going to take Kwanzaa and turn that into a financial payday. Everybody at McDonald's is going to put on a Kwanzaa hat and a Kwanzaa shirt, and they're going to do the same thing in Walmart. And when Black History Month come around, they're going to pimp that too for money. Because nothing's sacred. Why they don't pimp Hanukkah to Jews? Why they don't put on a Hanukkah hat at McDonald's or Burger King? Why they not selling Hanukkah products in Walmart and Macy's? Because they don't allow that. Because their holidays are sacred to European Jews. If you're not a European Jew, you cannot touch it. Now, black folks, nothing sacred. Nothing at all. Why did Joe Biden make Juneteenth a federal holiday this past summer? He didn't make Juneteenth a federal holiday because he cared about black folks. Because if that's the case, he would support reparations. The reason he made Juneteenth a federal holiday is because Juneteenth is the only all-black thing that we have that has not yet been colonized by white folks that still represents some degree of black autonomy and power. So in order to kill us, they got to kill Juneteenth. Every time the U.S. government endorses a holiday for black folks, they kill it. Think about Black History Month. When you was growing up, when I was growing up, Black History Month got a lot of respect. It was big. We waited for Black History Month. 28 days of programming, TV, radio, public library, black church. Black History Month was everything. It was bigger than Kwanzaa, bigger than Christmas. Look at it now. You can hardly find it in February. Ever since the White House started celebrating Black History Month, it's lost its value. Why? Because whenever they take over something black, they commercialize it. And when you commercialize something, when you commercialize something, meaning what? You make it safe for financial exploitation. You just robbed it of all sacredness. They did that with Black History Month. That's why you can't find Black History Month no more. I remember once upon a time, Kwanzaa was sacred. And that was a real big deal. 
Now, you still get your Kwanzaa celebrations, but it's nothing like it was in the 80s and the 90s. You know why? Because the White House started celebrating Kwanzaa, and they put it on the stamp. And once the White House approves it, now it's safe for what? The white corporations to exploit it. So now they have Kwanzaa at the, at the, uh, at the department stores, and they got Kwanzaa at the white libraries, and even white folks be celebrating Kwanzaa with no black folks around. <laughs> And one of the mistakes Dr. Karanga made, all respect to the elder, was he said that everybody can participate in Kwanzaa, although they cannot lead it. Now, I appreciate the fact he said they cannot lead it, but the fact you allowed them to participate in it was enough for them to kill it. We need something sacred. We invented hip-hop, we gave it right to white folks. Jazz music, we gave it right to white folks. We are so in love with being patted on the head by white folks that as soon as we invent something, we don't even think about making no money off of it. We want to give it to masses so we can get pat on the head. That's right, say it. Black people are in a state of perpetual psychological underdevelopment. We still deep down believe that we cannot make it without white folks. That's right. That's right. That, change, that thought has not changed and it cannot change as long as public education is preparing our children. Because the schools are never going to teach black children how to end white supremacy. They're only going to teach them how to make it stronger. That's why Barack Obama made white supremacy stronger. Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, Judge Tom Ass, they all make it stronger. But most of us raise little baby coons anyway because we tell our kids to do what? Get a good education and get out this neighborhood. That's what we do. Black kids are raised to get away from their people as quickly as they can. Most of you, as soon as you got a master's degree and good enough job, you ran right to a white suburb. Right. Black people are only integrationists with non-African people. When it comes to each other, we are totally segregationists. We talk about how white people move off the block as soon as there's more than one black family. Black people will move off the block as soon as there's more than one black family. <laughs> The most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said it best when he said, we are a race of people cursed with petty differences. Even if we don't have a reason to disagree, we will find one. Right. We still dealing with light skin and dark skin. Right. We still dealing with bourgeois and ghetto. We still dealing with educated and uneducated. We still dealing with Muslim and Christian and more, Nawafian and God and earth, nation of Islam, Pan-African Garveyite versus Pan-African socialist. We still dealing with the petty differences. Brothers and sisters, we don't need everybody to be a robot. We do not have to be homogenous on everything. We don't need to agree on everything. We just have to agree on certain things. Because I don't care what your political ideology is, all of the children got to be educated, they got to be fed, they got to be protected, they got to be employed, they need medical coverage, they need security, they need employment. At the end of the day, they all need the same thing no matter what you believe politically. We talk about how the black church is economically and politically irrelevant to black people, shows the black conscious community. I mean, after all, what have we done? We claim to be an alternative to the church. I can't tell. In fact, the black conscious community ain't nothing but church. We got our own bishops. We got our own pastors. We ain't got the Bible and the Quran, but all the books replace that. And what do we share in common with the church? No work, all words. That's one of the biggest reasons I wanted to get the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. Because I said, our people are going to get tired of this. You can't liberate black people with information. If you could, we'd be free already. You need organization to do that. Have you noticed that most of the time we come together, it's a conversation about the past? Every event about the past. And don't get me wrong, the past is important because we stand on it. But if you don't ever get around to talking about the present and the future, you're done. All we want to do is convince white folks we built the pyramids. They'll give you them pyramids. He'll give you that. You want to convince the white man to use the first man and woman? He'll give you that. He'll let you stay stuck in the past while he runs the present and the Chinese will take care of the future for you. You think black children is going to be content just knowing they were great 5,000 years ago? You got to give them opportunities in the present. The past is powerful, but it's never more powerful than the present. Because you cannot live back there. And one of the reasons we love to run back to the past and debate and discuss issues is because you can't change it. In other words, if I can trap this meeting into a conversation about the past, we never got to do no work. And one of the biggest reasons we fight all the time is we don't want to do no work. See, black people do not want to be accountable to other black people, not at all. And what I've learned is the more conscious you become, 
the more of a distraction you become too because you're so puffed up with information that your ego swells to the point where you feel you're the only one who can make decisions in the room. In other words, the ego of the Negro is a significant distractor from the progress of our people. I mean, look at all the black leaders who were murdered by the ego of another Negro. Malcolm X was murdered for the ego of another Negro. Patrice Lumumba was murdered for the ego of another Negro. Amical Cabral was murdered for the ego of another Negro. Huey P. Newton was murdered for the ego of another Negro. And we can go on and on all day long. How the black man has internalized the white man's consciousness. And we believe there could only be one king at the top. That's why we have the crab in the barrel syndrome, because on the plantation, they only rewarded one Negro at a time. So now when you see a black man or black woman make it, the jealousy factor kicks in because you think it'll only be one at the top, failing to realize we can all be at the top. God created a world of abundance. It's enough for everyone. And the safety of no one is guaranteed unless the safety of everyone is guaranteed. Parents, stop getting children evaluated for learning disabilities, especially under the age of eight. That's ridiculous. I'm seeing five-year-old boys with reading disabilities. Are you kidding me? Five years old with a reading disability in kindergarten? He just started learning how to read this year. And you didn't already let white folks stamp him. A math disability at six? That's ridiculous. Most of the time, your child has had poor preschool experiences, poor academic experiences in your home, no interest in learning, no homework, no reading, no nothing. It was cultural factors that led to that dis uh, deficiency, not a learning disability. Understand, you only go to special ed if you are disabled. You don't go to special ed because you're two grades behind. You don't go to special ed because you need extra help. You don't go to special ed because you don't feel like doing your work. You must be disabled in that area. You must absolutely require special ed in order to learn. And if you don't require special ed in order to learn, you're supposed to be in a regular classroom. Oh, yeah. You know how many autistic kids I had to yank out of special ed? Yes, he's autistic. He has social skills delayed. Y'all going to give him social skills training, but he don't need to be in no dumbed down class. That kid is smarter than most of the kids in a regular class. What is he doing over here? Special ed is disability plus need, not need alone. Excuse me, not disability alone. You got a son with so-called ADHD, but he's an AB or a BC student. Why does he have an IP? If the ADHD so-called, because it don't exist, if it's affecting his ability to function, he gets a 504 plan. But if it's not affecting his ability to learn, he cannot go to special ed. I had a young lady with a hearing impairment. She didn't want to hear it where the hearing aid. So they put her in special ed because she didn't want to wear the hearing aid. I said, well, first of all, I wouldn't wear it either. It looks like a computer on the side of a damn head. How about you get it a miracle ear that goes inside the ear so other kids can't tell she has this so she don't feel insecure about her appearance? And that's what we did. We switched out the air tube, and now she has a better hearing aid. She can sit in a regular class. We tore the IEP out. You don't go to special ed because you have a disability. You go to special ed because the disability affects your learning. And you parents with this ADHD nonsense, you need to stop it. Every other black boy in the hood is on stimulant medication. Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, Metadate. Are you crazy? These are nothing but synthesized forms of crack cocaine. The same drugs they sell on the street, they're giving your kids. So they can sit still long enough to learn about Anne Frank and Christopher Columbus. <laughs> and you know what makes it worse? We don't diagnose ADHD inside the classroom. ADHD got to come from the hospital or the clinic. I can evaluate for it outside of the school, but I cannot evaluate for ADHD in the school because it's a mental disorder. It's not a special ed disability. So that means any child in special ed for ADHD is only there because their mother or father went outside the school, got a diagnosis, brought the diagnosis back to the school. Look how ridiculous that is. You bring in white folks' paperwork that they can use to lynch your child with. If you never bring that diagnosis into the school, there's no way he could be in special ed for something the school don't even know about. ADHD. It's a joke. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. No, it's not. It's ain't no daddy at home disorder. ADHD. And why do I say that? Because over 85% of black boys diagnosed with ADHD don't have a father in their life. 
This is about a war on black males that send the fathers to jail, leave the mothers at home to try to raise sons on their own, which is not fair. Mm -hmm. And because the mothers can't do that because they're mm -hmm. overworked and they got enough responsibilities to handle, mm -hmm. they end up sending your son to the doctor because they don't want to give him his daddy back. This ain't got nothing to do with brain neurology. This is about systemic white supremacy. Kill all the males. And that's exactly what they're doing. See, there's six stages in the psychoacademic holocaust, brothers and sisters. First, they miseducate the kids on purpose. And you need to understand that miseducation is not a function of poverty. It's not a function of the dad in jail. It's not a function of the mother being on Section 8. It's not a function of Little Wayne or sagging pants or basketball. It's a function of racism. Black kids are deliberately miseducated in South Carolina. Why? Because if you don't deliberately miseducate black children in South Carolina, you cannot guarantee privilege for the white ones. You'll never see the black kids' test scores go as high as the white ones because white people make the test. They determine the measuring stick. The day black kids outperform white kids on any test, that test gets burned by the midnight. They can't do it. White kid privilege must be protected. And in order to do that, you give black kids the worst schools, the worst teachers, the worst resources. And the black community can't cry victim because you spend $2 billion a year on Air Jordans, $4 billion a year on liquor, $30 billion on weed permanent beauty products, $800 million a year on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork. You are literally financing your own heart disease. We buy twice the amount of Mercedes Benzes as white people, but we have one third of the wealth of Europeans. Can somebody explain to me where in the African DNA is Mercedes Benz? <laughs> the reason we're so addicted to the Mercedes is we're addicted to status. And since we don't enjoy real freedom in America, we would just rather surround ourselves with the symbols of it. That's why most Negroes spend most of their money trying to look more important than other Negroes. Will Smith said it best. Most black people spend too much money. They do not have buying things they do not need to impress other black people they don't even like. No more special ed. And if your child is in special ed, you can get them taken out. All you have to do is call an IEP meeting. And stop calling me up saying, Dr. Umar, what do I do? They put my child in special ed. Ain't no they. We! Your signature is required four times before any child goes into a special ed class. There is no they, it's always we, docile black parents and racist white teachers and school administrators. You need both to miseducate. Without a docile black parent, there is no school to prison pipeline. Without a I don't want to be bothered, just show me where to sign at black parent, there is no school to prison pipeline. You got to sign permission for the school psychologist to evaluate, that's me. You got to sign the evaluation report when I'm done saying you get you agree with it. You got to sign the IEP and then you got to sign the service agreement so special ed can be delivered. Your name must be signed four times before special ed starts. I don't want to hear about what they did. Talk about what y'all did. And remember this. They can't force you to put your child in special ed, but they can force you to keep them in once they're there. Remember this, they can't for force you to put your child on Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, and Metadate, but they can force you to keep them in, keep them on the meds, once they're on the meds. And I want y'all to understand something. Once you get the ADHD evaluation, they can force the medication. Mm. See, if you don't plan on doping your child, you must refuse the evaluation. Because the evaluation is the key that the school needs to call up Child Protective Services in Columbia to bully you to medicate your child. And if you don't, they'll take all the children from you. It's called medical neglect. It's one of the fastest growing reasons as to why black parents are losing their children. Medical neglect, not abuse. Not caregiving neglect, no. Failing to give your child dangerous medications because you didn't want to listen to Dr. Umar when he told you, refuse the eval because if they get the label, they will treat it like cancer. They treat ADHD like cancer. They will tell you your son has this mental problem and he needs the medication. And you know what I always ask white folks? Can you show me exactly where the ADHD is in his brain? Is it in the front? Is it on the side? Is it in the back? Where is it? The amygdala, the hippocampus, 
the prefrontal cortex, where exactly is the ADHD so we can see it first? I need to see it. Where's the reading disability? The top, side, bottom? Can somebody show me where the reading disability is in your child's head? Can you show me where the emotional disturbance is? You can't. It don't exist. These are not biological disabilities. They are imaginary ones. White folks made them up to destroy black children's opportunities. Killing their futures before it even gets here because some docile black parent loves to sign papers. If it was up to me, every time a black parent signs something you had no business sign, your finger should be broke off. Because your damn ink pen finger, that sign pen finger, messing black kids' lives up. And then every time I ask you, why did you get them tested? Because the teacher asked me. So you do anything white folks ask you to do? Right. I don't care what the teacher asked. Well, they thought it would be good to just see if he has it. Really? See if he has what? Did they ever show you the ADHD? Was there any brain scan, MRI, x-ray, blood sample, ultrasound, urine screening? Hell no. ADHD is an idea. The learning disability is an idea. Conduct disorder is an idea. Intellectual disability is an idea. It's not a scientific reality. It kills me how white folks make up stuff and black people just go crazy. <laughs> like I see a lot of black sisters running around with the feminist movement. I'm a feminist. Do you even know where this comes from? Do you not know that the women who founded this in America were racist, all of them? And when they founded the first... Uh, female abolition society to eliminate slavery, free black women couldn't even be a part of it because they said y'all was too stupid to participate. Wow. And here you is running off of, running after something white women and made up. And then modern feminism with Gloria Steinem was totally financed by the CIA and the FBI to get black mothers out the home so the government would have no problem getting to your child's brain and brainwashing them. CIA invented feminism. Not no women on the streets. FBI came up with the LGBT movement. That didn't come from the gays. That was a government thing. To do what? Reduce black population growth. <laughs> two boys can't make a baby, nor can two girls. This whole gay thing ain't got nothing to do with rights and family and love and romance. It's about making sure black people stay at 13 to 17% and not a percentage more. You've been locked at 13 to 17% for 20 years. How is that? We got more Mexicans. We got more Puerto Ricans. We got more Chinese. We got more Native Americans. We got more of everything. But black folks still 13 to 17%. Abortion, hysterectomy, black on black crime, mass incarceration, and LGBTQ, RST, UV, XYZ. I don't hate black gay people. I love all black folks. But I cannot allow the open promotion of that lifestyle because it means the end of the traditional black family. And if you've been watching television, and if you've been watching television, if you look at all the new shows, all the new movies, all the new commercials, it's either same sex or mixed race. You don't see no more black man and black woman on nothing. If she's black, he's white. If he's black, she's white. Or it's two women or two men. This is not for y'all. This is for the kids. They want to condition the children that happiness no longer equals a black man and a black woman. Wow. And then on top of that, we got silly YouTubian Negroes who create an entire markets out of attacking the opposite gender. You got a whole crew of beta males on YouTube, and all they do is make videos disparaging and degrading the black woman. And then you got a whole army of black women who don't do nothing but disparage and degrade black men in public before the whole world. Yeah. We're the only people who do that. The white man got problems with the white woman, but he ain't going to put it on YouTube every single day, a video a night on the opposite gender. And our children are watching this. So we are influencing them to consider some of these sick pathological European family systems. Marcus Garvey told us this 100 years ago. He said, if the black men and women are not careful, quote, they will drink in all the poison of Western civilization and die from the effects of it. And that's exactly what we're doing. Everything white folks throw out there, we jump right onto it. ADHD, that's a damn lie. It's either ain't no daddy at home disorder or it's artificial diet at home disorder. Too much sugar, caffeine, and high fructose corn syrup. Some of your kids are sugar addicts and you can't break them out of it because you a damn sugar addict. Or it's ain't no discipline at home disorder. Raheem does whatever he wants because that's my baby. 
<laughs> black mothers, I love you to death, and I commend all of you for holding down the household, giving the war against black males. But some of you need to do a better job because you're raising your son to be the exact type of man you yourself would never want to marry. Right. <laughs> And then you curse yourself, your own karma come back to visit you because you say you can't find a good man. That's because you're not raising none yourself. Everything you want your man to be, your son is not. How can you get it yourself? You want a hardworking man, your son lazy as hell. You want a man who respects women, your son disrespects everybody, including you. How are you going to ask society to give you something that you're not giving to society? Most black boys learn to disrespect black women from their mothers, not their fathers. Right. It's the mothers who tell them them girls ain't no good. Yes, they tell me. Dr. Umar, my father ain't around. My mother told me don't trust these hoes. That's right. It's true. Black men got issues. We got ego issues. But I tell you this, we'll squash it a lot quicker than a lot of sisters will. Y'all will hold a grudge until old age. 80 years old, still won't speak because she took your boyfriend in preschool. <laughs> Stop getting the babies evaluated, learning disabilities, and for ADHD. Do not give them the medication under any circumstances. Those medications kill blood, brain cells, mess with organ function, psychosis, suicidal thinking, homicidal thinking, tick disorders. It can stunt your son's growth. It can also cause early male pattern baldness, psychotic problems, and, and a lot of times it's irreversible. I know children who took psychiatric meds for two, three years. They can't even drive the car no more. They're so disoriented. Stop giving them crack for kids. And if you really think that they're so hyper, go to the drugstore, excuse me, the herbal store. There's all types of herbal remedies that you can use if you think your child's central nervous system is overstimulated. There's a product called Calm Child. There's another product called Melissa Supreme. There's all kinds of them out there. You drop them right under the tongue and they work to uh, calm down the central nervous system. But then again, I'm going to say don't even waste your money then unless you know your son has an opportunity to work off some of that natural God-given energy that he has. Because in many of our schools, there's no recess. There's no gym class. There's no class trip. There's no opportunity for a growing boy to work off natural energy. He's not disordered because he's a male. The problem with public school is that they want the boys to act like girls. And when you can't act like a girl, you're a problem. Public schools are dominated by female energy. The schools are white and they're all women. And so the black boy is twice discriminated against. He's discriminated against because he's black and he's discriminated against because he's a male. In essence, he's blackmailed by white women. Right. And America's research even tells you that teachers pay most attention to the children in the class who looks the most like their own. So if your son is blue, black, purple with a voice like Barry White, you know damn well he's going to end up on a special ed list. <laughs> it's true. Dark skin, swagalicious, young brother walking in that classroom. He represents everything that white teacher been told about black males. Stop going to school meetings by yourself, black parents. Always take somebody with you. Worst thing you can do is go into a school meeting alone. Take somebody with you. Because you need a witness to whatever was said in case you ever need to lodge a complaint or file suit against the district. This is why whenever you have a meeting, they bring 20, 30 white folks in there for one black mother. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm here to talk about my son's behavior. I got 20 devils sitting in front of me. You got to deal with the principal, the vice principal, the principal intern, the school nurse, school counselor, school secretary, school psychologist, grade leader, dean of students, trash man, bus driver, window washer, football coach. Why they bring so many white folks in there to talk to one black parent? Number one, to intimidate you, make you think you don't know your child better than them. And number two, to have a million witnesses to the lies that they're going to fabricate once the meeting is over. And you're defenseless against the lies because you didn't have nobody there to testify to your truth. You know how many black fathers I know can't even walk into their child's school anymore? Never put their hands on nobody. But a white teacher felt intimidated because he raised his voice. And because she felt intimidated, privileged white woman, because he raised his voice, he got a restraining order. Can't go back to back to school night or a pull call conference, and he is also going to miss graduation because he didn't listen to Dr. Umar. Don't go into schools alone. I'll never go into a school alone. Even when I was principal, I wasn't in a room alone with white girls or white teachers. 
Because the last thing I need is some old nasty white girl talking about I looked at a behind that she don't even have. <laughs> Leave the door open. I call my secretary and come sit in there. I need a witness to this in case she say somebody looked at something that I never want to look at. And black men, you should be embarrassed all these white girls you running around with here in South Carolina. What? You belong with the black woman, not the white woman, and I don't care if you don't like it. Absolutely unacceptable. I ain't got nothing against the white girl. I have no interest in degrading her. But when you walk with her, you degrade your sister, and then a lot of you will get around these white girls, and when you see a black woman, you won't even speak. You'll go out of your way to not even acknowledge a black woman when you're with a white girl. Hold the head up, brother. Talking about all white people ain't racist. Yes, they are, and only a fool doesn't know that. Every white person is racist. They have to be. White supremacy is only held together by the total commitment to the system of every European on the planet Earth. If all white folks was not racist, the system would have fell apart by now. But because you're so in love with white cookies, you want to give white women a pass. Well, if white women ain't racist so much, then explain to me why I don't see a white woman's movement against mass incarceration of black males. Why I don't see a white woman's movement against gentrification in South Carolina. Where's the white women's movement against the miseducation of black children? Where's the white women's movement against the police genocide of African people? Where's the white women's movement for the economic justice of black America? If the white woman is such a liberal, where's her damn social justice movements for you at? She ain't no damn liberal. She's just as racist as the white man. The difference is in the technique. The white woman's job is to psychologically disarm her victim with compassion. And you fall for it every time. Oh, I think she's different. Her ass ain't different. She plants technology on your ass. Low self-esteem needing a white girl ass black man. And then you want to call me up. Well, I think, you know, Doc, every black man with a white girl is not necessarily a coon. Yes, the hell you are. <laughs> if you don't like a black woman in, in Columbia, go get her from Goose Creek. <laughs> go get you a Greenville sister. And if the Greenville sister don't work, I know you'll get a Charleston sister that way. Yeah. If that don't work, go to another school. Go get a, excuse me, another state. Go to the Caribbean islands. Go to South America. Brazil got tens of millions of them. Go to Canada. Go to Africa. Go to the UK. Black women are the largest population in the world. It's amazing so many black men acting like they can't find one. I didn't say she was perfect. I know the black woman got issues. Piss her off, she'll put your business in the street. <laughs> But you got issues too. And if she can tolerate you, you can tolerate her. Because guess what? We're not winning this with no outside help. We're either going to save ourselves or we're going to be destroyed. You think that COVID bomb was a natural disaster? Hell no, that was a man-made white man disaster. He dropped the COVID bomb for four purposes. Purpose number one, to destroy the economy of all second and third world nations to make sure they would be re-indebted to the banking system of the globe. That's right, it was a reset button. Boop! All these African countries getting more independent, drop that COVID bomb and force them to shut down operations and put them back in poverty where they started. Number two, too many old people around the world, especially in Africa. We got to get rid of all these elders. That's why Italy got the hardest hit in Europe with COVID because Italy is home to the oldest European population in the world. And there's too many elderly black women in Africa. They want to get rid of them. And why do... Capitalists want to get rid of old folks because under capitalism, you're only useful. If I can exploit your labor, you work for me. Or I can exploit your dollar, you buy for me. So if you don't work for me and you don't buy from me, if I can exploit your labor or your dollar, you might as well be dead. And that's the problem of the elder. They don't work anymore and they don't need to buy much. But the society needs to take care of them. So in the eyes of white capitalism, they would be better off dead. And we have swallowed that. That's why as soon as our elders get a little bit sick, we stick them in old folks' homes. I'm not talking about a situation where your elder has so many complications that you can't possibly manage them and you have to work with the old folks' home. I'm talking about elders who can still walk, talk, and even take care of themselves. You got them in the old folks' home because white folks said that's where they're supposed to go when you get tired of them. But show me an old folks' home in ancient Africa. Show me an old folks' home back in the day. We didn't do that. How you going to fight the white man when he's living inside of you? Mm. 
Negroes always talking about being free of white supremacy when the white supremacy is living in you. Every black man got a devil in his heart. Every black girl do too. And until you kill the cracker in you, don't even pay attention to the one outside. Hello. Juneteenth, a federal holiday. I can't wait to see what happens next Juneteenth. Now that it's been integrated, you will have to share it with the LGBTQ. You have to share with the Afghan refugees. Watch what they do to Juneteenth. The best thing black people can do is continue to have our own independent Juneteenth celebrations. Don't you buy into this government thing. You mean to tell me as soon as Joe Biden get elect elected president, your first act of office was to sign an anti-transgender bill? That's the first thing you do when black people have been catching hell with these police and everything else. The first thing you can do is go protect the transgenders. I ain't got no problem with them not being beat up. But guess what? They don't come before me. They didn't build this country. I built this damn country. Wasn't no damn men in heels in the damn slave plantation. Who saw a man with heels on on his picking cotton? Wasn't no damn transgender slaves. But you got a damn transgender bill. And then you sign an anti-Asian hate bill. I understand. It was wrong what happened to those Asian women down in Atlanta. But you give them a bill that is so far reaching that it even criminalizes racial slurs against Asians. Did you know you can go to jail for publicly uttering a racial slur against an Asian, but you can call black people nigga and nothing happens to you? And then you give the Afghanis $2 billion? You flying them into every ghetto you can find, giving them housing, jobs, health care, and everything else. And I ain't heard one word about a COVID shot for an Afghan refugee yet. Yeah. Why are the Afghan refugees here, Dr. Umar? Same reason why Joe Biden giving the Mexicans a half million dollars a head to replace you. Oh, black people don't want to take the COVID shot, and you shouldn't. But since black people don't want to take the COVID shot, how can we use this to bring black Jim Crow? I know what we'll do. We'll lay off the Negroes and employ the Mexicans and the Afghanis, and we'll give them money for doing it. The Afghanis are your replacements, and the Mexicans are too. How the hell are you going to have a half million dollars to somebody who's not even an American citizen? But yet when the Haitian brothers and sisters showed up in Texas, you treated them like roaches and rats. Couldn't wait to get them up out of the place. And the irony of that is you should have been on your hands and knees thanking those Haitian brothers and sisters for their existence because it was the Haitian Revolution that quadrupled the physical geographical territory of the United States of America. All territory west of the Louisiana you got because of what Toussaint and Jean-Jacques Dessalines did. And you got the audacity to mistreat the people who swelled up the size of your nation. But then again, I got to look at us too. Because if we was organized, we could have took all the refugees in. All these closed public schools in the ghetto, all these closed buildings in the ghetto that we should be owning. The only reason why gentrification is kicking a butt on black America is because we ain't got our money organized enough to buy up all the stuff in the hood. We should own everything for sale. We got the money to do it. But we'd rather look good than do good, and that's our problem. Black parents... You got to get serious with your children. If you're not taking them to black museums to learn who they are, you're not on your job. If you're not taking them to black bookstores or to regular bookstores, your child should be reading at least one book a month in addition to what school requires. You should be checking the homework every night. They should be reading every night. Take them to visit the grave sites of our ancestors. Take them to visit the graves of their own bloodline ancestors. Most of our kids don't even know their family tree. Teach it to them. At the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, you don't graduate until you reconstructed your whole family tree. Because if your ancestors are going to be with you your whole life, you might as well know them by name. Oh. A damn Juneteenth holiday. You're giving other people rights and you're going to give us a damn celebration. <laughs> Remember they gave us Dr. King Day back in the 1980s? Look what they did to Dr. King Day. They turned that into a damn cleanup day. <laughs> Dr. King's Day is not supposed to be no damn cleanup day. But they use it as a day for black people to do all the money your tax dollars are supposed to pay for. Do all the work your tax dollars are supposed to pay for. It's a joke. But most of us are still on the Democratic Party plantation, are we not? Most of you in this room, you absolutely believe you got to vote Democrat for things to get better. And I'm asking you, what have we gotten from the Democrats? And we've been voting for them for almost 100 years. You do know that. 1932, 1933, FDR. We're about 10 years short of a century of voting Democrat. What have we gotten for voting Democrat? 
And I'm not advocating Republican either. I'm advocating South Carolina that you withdraw from both parties. Start a South Carolina State Black Political Union and you leverage your votes by negotiating with both parties for what you're going to get in exchange for your vote. And if they do not deliver on what they promise, you simply take those votes across the street to somebody else. Until we organize the black vote, it'll never work for you. It'll never work for you until you organize it. And you'll never get politicians to do anything about the police or the public schools until you organize the black vote. And the reason you'll never get politicians to do anything about the police or public schools before you organize the black vote is because politicians are scared of America's two largest and most powerful unions, and that is the Fraternal Order of Police and the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers. The teachers union and the police are the strongest in the country. That's why you never see the schools get better. That's why you never see police held accountable. That's why you never see teachers held accountable because every president, every governor, every mayor is scared to hold the police accountable for what they do to blacks and they're scared to hold teachers accountable for what they do to blacks. And which is so ironic, so many white women are married to white cops. They use the wife to miseducate the kids and then a husband lock them up when they're done. $250,000 white household in the suburbs of Columbia and they're living comfortably off of the miseducation of black children. Brothers and sisters, about seven years ago, we started raising money for a school in Wilmington, Delaware, the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Originally, we wanted a school in South, uh, excuse me, Virginia, uh, St. Paul's College. It was an HBCU that I learned about in 2014. And guess what? It only cost $2 million for a 118-acre ca campus with gym, dorms, lecture halls, cafeteria, only $2 million. But I couldn't raise the money fast enough. You know who owns St. Paul's now? Chinese. We let the damn Chinese purchase an HBCU built by African ancestors coming out of slavery. We are an embarrassment. You think the Chinese gonna let black people buy historically Chinese university? Hell no. But they own ours now. So once we lost St. Paul's, we kept on looking for a school. So finally, on February the 7th of 2019, we got lucky enough to get two schools, not one, in Wilmington, Delaware. Those are the schools we're working on right now. Now, contrary to popular belief, those schools are in very good condition, brothers and sisters. They were built from the ground in 2010, only 11 years ago, a $15 million project. I know the man who did it, Mr. Theo Gregory, attorney at law, former city council president for the city of Wilmington. But some white folks in Dover, Delaware didn't like him, so they sabotaged him out of existence, accused him of financial mismanagement, and after two years of operating his charter school, after building a $13 million campus, they shut him down. And y'all want to know why I don't want no charter school. I used to be a charter school principal and vice principal. The reason I don't want no charter school is because you don't control your destiny. As soon as they're ready to shut you down, they will find an excuse. They'll say you play with money. Or they'll say that you don't have enough uh, certified teachers. Or they say the children's test scores are too low. Whenever they're ready to get rid of a black charter school, they'll get rid of it. Because charter schools were founded for white children, not blacks. Poor white people who couldn't afford to send their kids to private school are the ones who gave birth to the charter school movement. A school that looks private, but is still publicly owned and controlled. The mistake black America made is we should have never gave up community control of the public schools. Our fight was always for community control. But you know what happened? Thirsty Negroes in the so-called woke movement said, wait a minute, if I take out this charter, I can pay myself $100,000 a year as the CEO and still hire a separate principal to do all the damn work. So once Negroes found out they could start paying themselves, they dropped the community control movement and went to charter school. Of course, it's going to be hard to operate an independent school or an independent hospital, but it's the only way to do it, brothers and sisters. I am sick and tired of white people controlling my destiny, and you should be too. But until we start pooling our money together and our resources together, we're not going to get out of this. Everybody knows black people hate black people more than they hate racism. <laughs> And the black church should be ashamed of itself. And why do you got such a problem with black church? It ain't got nothing to do with the beliefs. I don't care what you believe. You can pray to a damn trash can if you want. My problem with the black church is you take too much of three things from black people that should be focused elsewhere. Money, time, and emotional energy. Yep. Have you seen the type of money we give to the black church? I read somewhere the black church gets about a billion dollars a week. No, no, no. A million dollars a weekend nationally from black folks, something like one to five million dollars a weekend. With that type of money, every black church should have a bank. 
Amen. That type of money, every black church should have a school. Every black church should have a hospital. How you got all these mega churches in South Carolina and you don't put a single black child to work? If you claim to be doing God's work, why are you so comfortable with black people catching hell? We're the only people I know worrying about being happy after you die. Ain't nobody else waiting to die to get happy. <laughs> Think about that. And when you look at the history, Dr. King may have been an exception. Bishop Turner may have been an exception. We had some exceptions. But when you look at the black church and the role of the political struggle, a lot of the time they have been on the sidelines. Because most people don't become pastors to help black people. They become pastors to help themselves. Same thing with the politicians. Why do most black people run for public office? To change anything? Ain't nothing changed for you since Dr. King died and you've had tens of thousands of black elected officials. Negroes run for office because they know that in most municipalities, even if you only get elected to one term, you guarantee the retirement pension after you out of office. Nobody running for office to help you. They running for office to get themselves a comfortable retirement. I had an elected official tell me not too long ago, I don't care if my people don't vote me back and I'm getting my pension. That's what it's about. The politician and the preacher, two pimps, two different outfits. <laughs> and we need to purge them all. Brothers and sisters, understand. White folks are racist. All of them. The reason you don't get it is most of us think racism and bigotry is the same thing. It's not. Bigotry is where you hate another race. You don't have to hate black people to be a racist. Racism is not about hate. You could be a race-hating racist. But you don't have to be. Racism is about three things. Power, privilege, and control of all opportunities. Your white coworker, your white girlfriend, your white fiance, your white husband, your white next door neighbor, your white doctor, your white pastor, your white boss, your white attorney. You know what they all have in common? They want to dominate and monopolize all the opportunities in South, South Carolina away from blacks. All of the resources in South Carolina away from blacks and all the privileges in South Carolina away from blacks. And if you disagree with me, name me one white person in history who ever fought to eliminate white privilege. I have never seen one. You can show me white people who fought against police brutality. You can show me white people who fought for better schools. You can show me white people who fought to end black homelessness. You can show me white people who fought for this or fought for that. But you know what I call that? Symptom management. They have never tackled the causes of the unemployment, the causes of the bad schools, the causes of the black homeless, the causes of the police genocide. You think these white folks are benevolent because they're dealing in symptoms of racism, never attacking the problem. Remember, what was it, your last year when we had the George Floyd protests, the nationwide George Floyd protests that began in Minnesota? Well, I'll be on Dr. King's birthday, January 15th, God willing. That was a damn disgrace. Do you realize the George Floyd protests of 2020 were the largest, most comprehensive protests in American history since the Dr. King murder protests? And what did black people get out of it? Not a damn thing. And you know why? You made three mistakes with the George Floyd protests. I mean, our issues was on television for the first time every day, all day. We haven't had that since King. And maybe Rodney King. Three mistakes we made. Number one, we integrated the march. Yep. Yep. The George Floyd march should have stayed black. You should have told your white boyfriends and girlfriends, stay their nasty mayonnaise asses at home. <laughs> this is for black people. But you couldn't do that because you love white folks too much. <laughs> do you realize the Pew, the Pew Research, the Pew Research Trust found that one in five protesters were black. Four in five protesters were white. So how could your issues ever be the priority when you letting your oppressor represent you? That should have stayed all black. You let everybody in, Mexicans, Chinese, Arabs, and some of the protests in. What does, what does Donald Trump sign? The Hispanic Prosperity Initiative. Black people said, wait a minute, how did he get? And then the Native Americans got something. They said, wait a minute, those was our marches. No, it wasn't. It should have been your march. But since you integrated all the groups that integrated with you got something out of it except you. If you don't learn how to stand by yourself, you'll never get nothing. I'm so sick of us calling ourselves people of color. What the hell is that? <laughs> Trying to blend in because you're ashamed to be black. And then you got a whole I ain't from Africa movement on YouTube. 
I ain't from Africa. Look just like Shaka Zulu with your dumb ass. <laughs> My ancestor was already here. You don't even know your great grandfather's last name. You don't know who the hell was here. <laughs> now wanting to be black, I call them the Pretendian Nation. The Pretendians, not Indians, Pretendians. Last time I checked, everybody came from the mother continent except the Pretendians in America. Ain't that interesting? But here's the bigger question I got for the Pretendian Nation. It's not whether you was here already or not. Here we go, arguing over the history again. I don't care about the history right now. What are we going to do for our children? That's my question. Pretendian or African, it don't matter. White folks don't like none of us. What are we going to do? That's the question. Whenever we have a meeting, we got to come together for purpose, brothers and sisters. The purpose of building this. The purpose of changing that. Too many intellectual and ideological masturbation sessions. It got to stop, y'all. We got five major problems in this country. Five. Five. Miseducation. Mass incarceration. Gentrification. Police genocide. And access to wealth. And I'm willing to bet you there's not a black politician in the state of South Carolina that got a solution for any of them. I'm willing to bet there's not a Negro in your state who has a plan, not a promise, a plan on paper to tackle any one of those five. The Congressional Black Caucus down in Washington, D.C., I'm still trying to find out why those 59 Negroes exist at all. The Congressional Black Caucus ain't done nothing for black folks, been around since 1971, and not one measurable gain. Nothing! The only time you see them Negroes is when white folks got to get elected. You notice that? White man got to get elected. You see them, so when the white man get elected, they go back underground like a damn uh, earthworm or something. I love Maxine Waters, but what are y'all doing for black folks? Y'all should have been walk. Y'all should have had a sit in in Trump's uh, in uh, Biden's office. Trump's too. Y'all should have walked right into the White House and sat down and said, "We having a sit in. All fifty nine of us. Lock us up if you want. You know how powerful that would be. If all fifty nine U.S. Congressmen and women of African race walk into the president's office and say, "We not leaving until you do something for our people," but they won't do it. They scared of the white folks. Which is why I don't vote for black people if they're not independent candidates. I'm not voting for another black Democrat. I'm not voting for a black Republican. Why not, Dr. Umar? Because if you're a black Democrat or a black Republican, you belong to a white racist party that does not prioritize your people's issues. That's right. That's why they don't speak up for you the way that they should. Because the Democratic parties in the background say, don't sound too black or you will distance the conservative white voters we need at the midterms. So every black elected official is on a balancing beam doing this shit here to make sure they don't distance certain white voters. Y'all know the games they play. If we want black politicians to represent black people, we got to finance them ourselves. The most important thing you do with a politician is not vote, you finance them. Because the hand that pays is the hand that rules. If you can elect somebody in Columbia, South Carolina, on 100% black money, they don't owe Walmart nothing, they don't owe the Democratic Party nothing, they don't owe the white banks nothing, they are free. Once they get elected, all you got to do is make sure they got 24-hour security. That's the only thing left, because they have a free slate. All you got to do is look at who financed these people, you know whose agenda they're going to carry out. Look at the campaign contributions. If voting could change anything, it would be illegal. I want to say thank you to South Carolina for all of you who've donated to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I regularly get a lot of donations across the state of South Carolina. For those of you who missed our first annual festival, please come next year. It will be on Saturday, September the 10th, God willing, right there in Wilmington, Delaware, 20 minutes from the Philadelphia International Airport. Wilmington is Philly's backyard. I could actually get to the school quicker than I could get to other places in the city of Philly itself. It's the point at which Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland all meet, Wilmington, Delaware. So we're working on the school, God willing. It'll be done by the end of the calendar year, but of course I said that before, but I don't control the setbacks. When I get back to the city, we're going to get the HVAC put in. Hopefully everything connects well, and we ain't got to spend no more money for HVAC repairs. I got a little bit more plumbing, a little bit more electric, and we should be able to apply for our certificate of occupancy. Once the school is open, we're going to have a grand opening. I'm hoping we get to do it for February. 28 days of black history inside of FDMG. And I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, I tell you right now, you're going to be spending a lot of time at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy because in addition to being the school, those four buildings 
will also double as the Central Black Community Organizing Headquarters. We're going to be having an all-black women's conference, all-black men's conference, ex-offender conference, black farmers conference, black cosmetologist conference. And I'm going to have a snow bunny conference for all you white girl loving coons to find out what your problem is. It's going to be a conference every weekend, so I'm letting you know right now. Some of y'all probably going to end up moving to Wilmington, Delaware. The property is pretty cheap right now. They're about to gentrify it soon. But you might want to start looking at Wilmington, Delaware, because every day something's going to be going on. Not events, but meetings, think tanks, conferences, and seminars to pull us out from where we are to where we need to be. And quiet is kept. The school is just the beginning of the dream. I can't put all my plans out there because the YouTubians will put it all out on YouTube. Right. Okay? But the school is just the foundation and institution of a black Wall Street you want to build in Wilmington. We got plans for a clinic, which we want to evolve into a church. We got plans for a black community college. Yes, we have plans for the daycare center. We have plans for a lot of things. Manufacturing sector, and it's the perfect place to do it. Two hours from D.C., 90 minutes from Baltimore, two hours from New York, 20 minutes from Philadelphia. We're right on 95 South. Can't miss us. Okay. So that's where we are. So make sure y'all keep on donating. We need y'all help. Don't listen to the coons, because if you listen to the coons, I'm going to have to put you in the book of Negroes, and you won't be allowed on the campus. Okay? It's funny, when we did the festival on September 11th, I had all kind of haters messaging me in the inbox. Doc, I didn't mean it, Doc. They just had me kind of messed up for a minute. Can I come to the block party? Hell no. Because you speak it out against something we're doing for our kids. Now, maybe I'm blind, but I don't know of another person in our race doing what I'm doing in this state. That don't make me more important. It don't make me better than nobody else. But the void that I feel, it ain't being filled by nobody else. Certain people should be off limits because they do the work that needs to be done. Making videos on YouTube is not work. And I got more videos than any scholar alive. And I still don't <laughs> consider that work. Work is when I'm out there saving them kids. Work is when I'm trying to build that school. Work is when I'm trying to create systems and alternatives for our children. Mm -hmm. For those of you who do have children, we will be hosting the Unapologetically African Black College and Consciousness Tour next summer. There's going to be two tours, one for the 11 to 17-year-old black boys and girls and another one for the 18 to 25-year-old black boys and girls. So if you have a son or daughter, 11 to 17, it would be your responsibility to get them to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy on the day we leave. Now, you can fly them to Philly. You can put them on a train to Philly. You can put them on a bus to Philly. We will pick them up. We will get them, and we will make sure to get back on that plane, back on that train, black on that bus to come back to Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, but you can work with us to get the child, all right? And it's going to be two weeks, 14 days and 14 nights. I'm taking them to the Harriet Tubman home, Harriet Tubman grave, Frederick Douglass home, Frederick Douglass grave, the Nat Turner Trail, Benjamin Banneker's home, the um, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. They're going to go to the world-famous Apollo Theater. They're going to go to the Malcolm and Betty Shabazz Center. They're going to go to Malcolm's grave, Dr. Kylie's grave, Dr. Ben's grave, James Baldwin's grave, Aaliyah's grave. Uh, where they're also going to go to the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum. They're going to go to the Black African Holocaust Museum in Philadelphia, which is the only museum in America dedicated to the enslavement of African people. Uh, I'm going to give them the downtown Philadelphia uh, tour because people think Philadelphia is the birthplace of freedom. Philadelphia is the birthplace of slavery. Okay, Independence Hall was where they enforced the, the 1850 uh, fugitive slave law. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Cheney, Lincoln, Morgan State, Copper State, Bowie, Howard, uh, Hampton, uh, 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 Virginia Commonwealth, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. There's about 15 HBCUs they're going to hit. I'm going to take them to Great Adventure. They're going to go to Dorney Park. They're going to go to Atlantic City to the beach. They're going to have fun, but they also want to learn. And every other night in the hotel conference center, there will be a seminar on something that is important for our children, African history. Respecting your parents, planning your future, dealing with emotions and anxiety as a young person, which is very important because in case you don't know, suicide for all black people is up. And for teenage black girls, it is through the roof. And I want all of y'all to know right now, do not play around with children when they say they want to kill themselves. I do not play. Let a child in my presence say they want to kill themselves. You're going to the psychiatric uh, emergency response center, and I know you're going to sit there all night before somebody see you. That's exactly why I'm going to take your ass so you can sit there all night and know next time don't open your mouth and say you want to hurt yourself unless you mean it. But parents, don't think you know your children as well as you think you do when it comes to suicide. 
take them to the hospital. Every emergency room at every hospital in America has an on-call psychiatrist or psychologist. Their job is to do the emergency suicide screen screens. And trust me, it's a good deterrent for your child to keep them from saying it again. Because you got to sit there all night until the psychiatrist finally shows up and do their little 30-minute screener. And then you get a piece of paper, mom or dad, God forbid, in case your child does commit any type of self-harm, you have a form from a licensed doctor say to stand that they cleared your child to go back home with you. You got to have that. You got to have that. Suicide is the second leading uh, cause of death for young black men and the third leading cause of death for adult black men. Suicide. We are killing ourselves like it's no tomorrow, but you never hear about it on the news because white folks only care about black people with guns who can kill them. They don't care about us killing ourselves. Okay? Black people are dying. I regularly get text messages and email messages and inbox communications from brothers and sisters who are losing people to death by self-destruction. It's hard being black in America. That's why we got to unite and do more for each other. And that's why I'm just so thankful that I feel like we're on the brink of finally completing FDMG, brothers and sisters, because we don't have a lot of places in this country that we can go to and meet and plan and strategize and organize. I can count on one hand the amount of places I've been to speak at that was literally black owned. 90% of the time we're renting from non-Africans. And that's not just true for America. I've spoken everywhere but Australia. And damn near everywhere I go and speak, including in Africa, owned by non-Africans. You know what hurts me? When I travel the world, I see four things. Constant in every black community. I don't care if I'm in Jamaica. I don't care if I'm in South America. I don't care if I'm in Toronto. I don't care if I'm in Ghana or Ethiopia. What are the four things I see in every black community on the planet? Number one, white Jesus. White Jesus is universal. And I'm in South Carolina, so I know some of you Negroes got a white Jesus in your house. <laughs> this is the heart of the Confederacy here. So I know some of you Negroes got a white Jesus. And when you go home today, burn that damn picture. <laughs> burn it. You should not have an image of your deity. You should not have an image of your deity that looks like your enemy. Nobody's deity looks like the enemy but you. You go home and you burn it. You can't put it in the trash. You know why you can't put it in the trash? Because if you put that painting outside in the trash, another coon will come get it and hang it up in the house. Burn that damn thing. That's number one, white Jesus. Number two, white curriculum. 95% of the world's African children are taught a white curriculum. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why we ain't got no more revolutions no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because look who's teaching our children. They control the information that goes into our babies' heads. What's the third thing I see? Unemployed black men, which equals mass incarceration. Black men are filling up the prison, single black mother raising kids on their own. And what's the fourth thing I see? Every economy in the black community is dominated by non-African everywhere on the planet. You cannot name me a city, a town, a state, a country where the economy is dominated by black folks. Not even in Africa. Not even in the Caribbean. Every African community has a non-African alien dictating economic activity. Absolutely sad. Brothers and sisters, we got to get it together. Everybody know we the next great superpower, not the Chinese. But we got to get it together. We got to believe in each other more than the individual. Negroes are the most individualistic people I know. All we care about is us. I had people walk past my book. They said, oh, my kids is grown now. I don't need the book. I said, how selfish you are, Queen Mother. Why you say that, Dr. Umar? Don't you know in African culture, the children don't belong to parents. They belong to the village. Every child in your community is yours. You read that book, you might be able to save somebody else's child because their parents ain't going to read it. I think about yours and mine's and this yeah. and that. Yeah. Well, if everybody just take care of their kids, black America be okay. No, it won't. Mm -hmm. White people take care of their kids too, but they still come together and organize to dominate resources. Mm -hmm. Chinese take care of their kids, but they still come together and organize and dominate resources. We hate working together so much, we try to come up with solutions that don't require cooperation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we're going to teach economic science. They will learn real estate, they will learn stock, they will learn investing, they will learn money management, they will learn how to do their own taxes as children. Agricultural science, they will be digging in the ground. We're building relationships with black farms all over the country. We plan on having black farmer retreat weekends for our boys, where we take them to different farms and they stay there all week and they learn something new about a different grain, a different fruit, a different way of cultivating the soil and the land. 
Because you do know in our culture, the earth is a deity. It is a living, breathing manifestation of God, and it is a source of healing. And I would argue one of the reasons black people are so toxic and getting so many diseases is we no longer tap into the belly of the mother of the soil. You got to put your hands in the dirt. There is God force in the soil, and we will do that at FDMG. We will also teach political and military science, which is the science of how white folks snatched everything from black folks and how the Chinese are getting ready to snatch it again. Okay, we will teach our children responsible self-defense with and without weapons. If you got a problem with your son learning how to use a gun, don't send him to my school because we live in the real world, not the one in that Bible. Okay? These white men out here teaching their kids at five and six, they're getting guns for their fourth birthday. And you out here talking about some Jesus ain't have no gun. Jesus don't live in 21st century Columbia, South Carolina either. <laughs> We will also teach the science of the black man and black woman. We got to teach our boys how to love the black woman, how to honor the black woman, how to respect themselves. One night every week, there will be a family dinner with a certain grade of boys and myself and the teachers and staff. And we're going to sit around and we're going to talk and we're going to learn. And then I do my fireside chat where all the boys come with me. We open up a bonfire and I teach them a different story from a different ancestor in the past. First two weeks of school will not be inside the school. It will be out in the hills and in the mountains where they will learn the pledges and the chants and the songs of FDMG, where they will learn the bonds of FDMG. And then once we turn them into students who are ready to learn, then we go into the classroom. Mm -hmm. One weekend out of every month, they have to go to school or during the weekend to make up for all the time that they missed in the classroom. And for those of you who got special ed kids who you think need so much help, no problem. We won't have special ed, but I tell you what we will have, Weekend Academy. You know what Weekend Academy is for? It's for kids who think they got reading disabilities. And the kids who think they got ADHD. Kids who think they got emotional disturbances. You can't control your temper tantrums? No problem. You will come to school Saturday and Sunday from 8 in the morning till 8 at night until you stop temper tantruming. You can't read? No problem. You're going to come to school from 8 in the morning till 8 at night until you learn how to read. Who would have bet me $100 that after two weeks I will have no special ed problems after Frederick Douglass lost his father's death? Everybody will learn how to read all of a sudden just fine. Stop letting your kids run them games on you. I can't wait till the school open up. Brothers and sisters, if you want to work at the school, send me your resume. You do not have to be a certified teacher but you cannot be a certified coon. <laughs> yes, we need math, we need science, we need language, we need social studies, but guess what else we need? We need brothers and sisters who know African martial arts because we're teaching it as a science. We need brothers and sisters who know how to do natural hair. We need brothers and sisters who know how to do natural food because we will be 90% raw and vegan institution. We need brothers and sisters who know how to build websites, do documentaries, teach photography, teach children how to make clothing. The question is not whether you're a licensed teacher. Get that out your head. The question I'm asking you here today, South Carolina, do you have a skill that you think is worth our children learning it? And if you have a skill to teach that you think could benefit our children if they learned it, you should be sending me a resume. Yeah. We are a nation-building institution. FDMG will be the first school in American history that is not focused on college prep. I'm so sick and tired of these damn college prep schools. All of our kids got accepted to college. I guess so when the economic recession in college is a business. Yes. Of course they're going to get accepted. How many finished in four years? How many finished at all? Brothers and sisters, I'm not a hypocrite. I got six degrees from three different universities. I just spoke at my alma mater last Tuesday, Lehigh University, Lehigh University of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. But guess what? I was a freshman in college in 1992. We 30 years removed from that now. When I went to school, getting a college degree still meant a little bit of something. And then I majored in psychology. I got lucky because I majored in mental illness for Negroes. And as long as you Negroes stay sick, I will always have a job. So I got lucky. But most of our sons and daughters, they won't get that lucky. Do you know there's 2 million Africans in this country with master's and doctorate degrees who cannot find a job? 2 million! And you can't wait to send your son and daughter off to college to do what? And then a lot of our kids are in college wasting their time majoring in degrees that have no economic relevance when they get out. If you want to send your child to college and these colleges are charging $30,000 to sixty a year, why is your son majoring in art history for $60,000? He can study art history at the public library with a library card. 
your daughter getting a degree in community organizing and every class taught by white folks. Come on, y'all. If they want to be a teacher, they got to go to college. You want to be an engineer, a doctor, a psychologist. I understand that. But if you got a son or daughter who don't know what they want to do with their life, why are you gambling on it for 60000 a year? If Dr. Umar was in charge, if I was in charge, every child in the state of South Carolina would go to trade school right after high school. You know why? Because it's only two years. You're not going to get almost no loan debt. And most importantly, you will have a lifelong skill that can yes, pay sir. your bills. Yes, the reason the prisons are filling up with black men is we no longer send our boys to trade school to learn the skills that pay the damn bills. The reason grandpa was never unemployed is grandpa had a skill that could pay a damn bill. College ain't giving you no damn skills. They're giving you information that doesn't even matter when you get out. Raise your hand if you owe student loans. The whole damn room. And guess what? Most of us with student loans don't even work in the area that we got the degree in. What good was it? White America putting the whole black community into long-term debt and they using a the degree to do it. Now, with that being said, I do have to admit that I probably am going to go back to college, although I don't want to. And the reason I'm thinking about going back to college is because we do not have a major educational attorney in this country. And so when I help a parent uh, fight a situation with their child, most of the time, you can solve the problem on your own. That's what my new book is about, Black Parent Advocate. But once in a while, you have a situation that will have to go to court. There's no black attorney in this country that I've met who specializes in educational law. And since we don't have an attorney to fight some of these cases that our mothers and fathers are facing with their children, I'm going to have to be it. So I'm going to go and get one more degree from these crackers to become an educational attorney so I can represent families in court when the need arises. Because we haven't had a major educational decision to benefit black children since 1954. This should have been a class action lawsuit against the over-identification of black kids for special ed. This should have been a class action lawsuit for the over-identification of black kids for ADHD. This should have been a class action lawsuit against the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association for letting black boys get diagnosed with ADHD when the evaluating psychologist never even observed the kid in the class. Most of the time your kids get diagnosed with ADHD, the psychologist never even went to the school to observe the kid. ADHD is an externalizing behavior. You got to diagnose it with your eyeballs, but you never put eyeballs on a kid. But you said he had ADHD anyway because of a complaining black mother and a complaining white teacher. Mm -hmm. That is if they let me in law school, because at this point, they all know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I might got to change my name to get it. I'm going to apply to the black ones first, but they be cooling even worse than the white ones, to be honest with you. We can't have you in here, E5 Tune Day, with the shit you be talking. <laughs> In conclusion, brothers and sisters, take your phone out. I'm going to give you my number so you know how to reach me. If you ever have any issues with your children, and then we'll take some questions and answers. My cell number is 215-989-9858. Somebody happy they paid the phone bill. If you don't turn that damn thing. 215-989-9858. Nine eight five eight. Once more, two one five. Nine eight nine. Nine eight five eight. Email address: Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. D R U M A R J O H N S O N at yahoo.com. That's how you reach me. I must admit to you though, once the school is open, I'm going to have to change my number, and I don't want to change that number. Two one five nine eight nine nine eight five eight is so personally relevant and meaningful for me because I've had that number. This is my first trip to Africa back in 2005. And I got that number because somebody in the South African or Nigerian airport stole my luggage and they uh, found my cell phone that I ridiculously packed in the suitcase and they ran the bill up like $5,000. And so when I got back to the States, luckily I, I took a police report out on the theft of the cell phone, but I forget what company I was with at the time. They discharged the bill, but then they also dropped me from their service. So I had to go to Sprint, which is now T-Mobile, and that was the number that I got. So that's why so many nines in the number because it represents the ancestors who came back with me uh, mm. from Africa in 2005. So sure. I don't want to give the number up, but I'm going to have to because you Negroes don't want to call me all day long when I'm trying to run a school and I can't have that. <laughs> I want to close with a quote from my ancestor, Frederick Douglass. My family came to an America, that is the paternal side of my family, came to America in 1701. A black man by the name of Bailey's, most likely stolen from the Igbo nation of Nigeria. He married a black woman, Grandma Selah, for whom my 10-year-old daughter is named. In 1745, they had Grandma Jenny. 
1774, Grandma Jenny gave birth to Grandma Betsy. My Grandma Betsy, who was my six times great grandmother, was born into slavery, but she married a free black man. My six times great grandfather, Isaac Bailey. It just so happened he had the same last name as well. They had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet, and another daughter was named Betsy, my five times great grandmother. These two sisters were raped by Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned our family. As a result of that rape in February of 1818, Aunt Harriet gave birth to arguably the greatest black leader in American history, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. In 1838, Cousin Fred ran away from slavery, and he changed his name to hide his identity. So in 1838 in New York, Frederick Bailey became Frederick Douglass. Well, in 1819, my grandma Betsy gave birth to Frederick's first cousin and half-brother, my four times great-grandfather Stephen Henry Bailey. They were cousins because their mothers were sisters, but they were also half-brothers because the slave master raped both sisters. In 1861, the Civil War starts. Grandpa Stephen marries Grandma Caroline, who didn't learn how to read until 1909, the year the NAACP was founded. On November the 14th of 1841, they had my three times great-grandfather, George Washington Bailey, who went on to become the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland, which is the hometown of Harriet Tubman's parents. So when the Civil War begins, Frederick sends two sons, Lewis and Charles. They go north to Boston. They fight in the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, that's the story of the sons of Frederick Douglass. But let us not be remiss to mention that grandfather of Pan-Africanism, Martin Robinson Delaney, the first black uniform officer in the Civil War, his son was also a participant in the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment. My grandfather Stephen and his son, my grandfather George, fought in the United States Colored Troops of Maryland. My grandfather Stephen was actually present in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, when General Gordon Granger read Special Order Number 3, liberating all remaining enslaved Africans in the state of Texas. My grandfather was there. When the Civil War was over, Grandpa George marries Grandma Annie. Grandma Annie is the niece of Bishop Alexander Wayman, who's the seventh bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church after Richard Allen. He was also the manager of the Philadelphia Underground Railroad House, from which William Still got that office, and that's when he recorded the largest collection of escaped slave narratives in world history. So then, Grandpa George and Grandma Manny have Grandma Caroline. She moves to Philadelphia. She has Grandma Vivian. Grandma Vivian marries a Spanish-speaking Cuban immigrant. My great-grandfather's sister wrote from Cuba. They have my Grandma Ida. She marries Jane Johnson. They have my father, Jamal. He marries Barbara, and on August the 21st, the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, August the 21st, the anniversary of the Nat Turner War, August the 21st, the anniversary of the George Jackson War against mass incarceration, Umar Johnson was born in Philadelphia. Brothers and sisters, this coming Thursday, we will be at Nat Turner Lane again. If you've never been in Nat Turner Lane, try to get there soon. Baba Khalifa is the elder. He lives on the land. He does a full tour on the life and legacy of the great Nat Turner, who I believe is the greatest revolutionary to ever walk on American soil, black or white. You go to the church where Nat Turner preached. You go to the land where his wife, Cherry, once had the cabin. You go to the courthouse where Nat Turner was interviewed and incarcerated. And you even go to the trunk of the tree where Nat Turner was executed on November the 11th of 1831. That's why I go down there twice a year. On my birthday, August the 21st, because that's when the Nat Turner War started. And on November the 11th, because that when Nat Turner was hanged between the hours of 10 and 2. I go there to refuel, to re-energize, because dealing with coons can weigh you down. So I go to Nat Turner Land. That's my annual pilgrimage to Nat Turner Land. And my favorite site in Africa is the Guri Island Slave Dungeon because that's where I had my ancestral epiphany back in 2005 when I took my first trip. So it's Guri Island in Africa, but it's Nat Turner in the United States. If you want to join us, you can go to natturnerlibrary.com to register. That is natturnerlibrary.com. And if you can't be there on the anniversary next Thursday, you can go anytime. Just reach out to Baba Khalifa and schedule the tour. But Baba Khalifa is an elder. He's up in age. And one day he's going to retire from doing that tour. And I don't want you to not have the Baba Khalifa experience because he is a master on the life and legacy of Nat Turner. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the favor of freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean, but they're scared of the awful roar of the water. He said the struggle we have might be moral or it might be physical or it might be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. He said, a man may not get all you pay for in this world, but you will pay for all that you get. And if we as a people are ever to become free, we must pay for the removal of that oppression. We may pay with blows. We may pay with blood. We may pay with our lives. But he who wants to be free must strike the first blow. 
Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years, I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But the good Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and prayed with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white people, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you would never respect you. The man who respects you has no need for pity. He said, but most of all, remember, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. The most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. Mr. Garvey was once asked, are you an African or are you a Jamaican? Are you an African or are you a Jamaican? In response to that, His Excellency, the provisional president of Africa, the elected provisional president of Africa, Marcus Messiah Garvey said, you ask me, am I African or am I Jamaican? And I tell you, I would never give up a continent for an island. I am an African. One God, one aim, one destiny. Black power. Black power. Before we get started with the book signing. Q&A first, Bob. Yo, Q&A yeah. first? Okay, please don't forget. We ask that each and every one of you, if you haven't already, that you do a, uh, do a donation for us at the door because so that we can continue to bring you the people to come in to speak to us, to give us the jewels, to give us knowledge and wisdom as life continues to give us clarity and understanding. So we have to make sure that we can keep this process going. We've been, uh, uh, we've been blessed with Dr. Umar Johnson being here today, and we want to make sure that we can continue to do so. So please, don't forget about us at the door. With, uh, with the donation. Okay, this is what we're going to do. If you have a question, I'm going to give you a number. <clears throat> Don't forget your number. Let me tell you a little secret. I've done Q&As on every continent except Australia. I've never had Negroes in a room who can remember their number. <laughs> so if you can please let South Carolina make history today and be the first Q&A where you don't forget your number or steal somebody else's. Let's try to do that because it never happens. Also, once we're done with the Q&A, if anybody would like to take a picture with Dr. Umar or if you want to purchase a book, I will sign it. The books are $50 a piece, credit card, cash, or cash app. If you're using cash app to pay for the book, it is dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson. If you only use dollar sign Dr. Umar, that is a fake account. It is not mine. You must put Johnson on it. Dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson if you want to use Cash App. Credit card, we have the PayPal back there, excuse me, the Square, and also Cash as well, okay? So that's what it, that's with the books. If you can't get the book today, you can order it on my website, but there's $70 online, and you gotta wait for me to ship it, but you can get it today for 50. The book is divided into two parts. The first half of the book is sample letters for parents to deal with any problem you have in the school. They wanna evaluate your child, you don't wanna be evaluated, I give you the letter. All you gotta do is reproduce it and sign it. Your child needs speech and language therapy, and the school is refusing to give your child a speech and language evaluation. I got the letter. The school is complaining that your child doesn't pledge the flag. I got the letter. They cannot make your child pledge the flag. That is a First Amendment right, freedom of expression. Not only can your child not pledge the flag, they can even make your child stand when the flag is being pledged. I have the letter in there. If your child is in special ed and they haven't been getting the help that they deserve, you can make the school district pay for your child to go to a private school. The letter you need to give them is in there. If you get the psychological evaluation and you don't agree with it you have a right to a second opinion and you can make the school district pay for the second opinion evaluation the letter is in there I made it as simple as it can be the second half of the book I teach you how to understand documentation I go through the psychological eval step by step so you can know what should be in your child's psyche eval and what shouldn't be in your child's psyche eval and I'm gonna tell you this right now if you ever get a psyche eval and the psychologist did not talk to you if you were not interviewed give it back there's no way a psychologist can make a qualitative determination of disability or mental illness. And I never spoke to the parent. You want to know why? Because only you know if that child was born full term. Only you know if that child ever been hospitalized. Only you know how many different schools that child been to. Only you know if that child was verbally abused, sexually abused, physically abused. All of the background information matters when we make a decision. So if you did not give your input, the evaluation is not valid, and you therefore should ask for an independent evaluation at school district expense. You have a lot of power. You have a lot of power, but you have to use it, and that's the purpose of that book. So with that being said, if you have a question, raise your hand. Try to remember your number. You are number one. In the black, brother, you're number two. Sister in the back, you're number three. Right here, brother, you're four. Bobby with the black hat, you're five. 
Is that a brother or a sister with the hand? Brother, six. Okay. Sister, you are seven. And right here, brother, eight. Let's stop with the eight and see how, 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 how we done then. Okay? Remember, questions, not dissertations. Movement number one. Go right ahead. And I will repeat. All right. Let's uh, give Dr. Umar a hand for coming down. I didn't even know that was you. <laughs> about spirituality mm -hmm. it is so beautiful it's just like you get to know yourself a lot more uh -huh. and white people call it witchcraft or something mm -hmm. like that so can you please explain to me on why did they call it witchcraft or something like that because it's just kind of confusing I'm like, I thought the only way to get to God is you know you know believe in spirit and everything and uh, that's my question <laughs> great question Okay, I'm going to repeat it. He's talking about traditional African spirituality and why do white people consider it witchcraft? Well, first of all, you got to understand European culture is thoroughly capitalistic and monopolistic. They have to be able to control it and they have to be able to exploit it. If white people can't control it and they can exploit it, it don't exist or it gets demonized, right? So, with African spirituality, white people cannot control it and white people cannot exploit it financially. So it's witchcraft for now. But as long as these white people keep on going to Africa and studying the systems mm -hmm. and being initiated into the systems, let me tell you what's going to happen in the next 30 years. You heard it from me first. Don't be surprised you wake up one day and you find out that a law has been passed in the state of South Carolina, which is the home of the Oyotunji African village down in Sheldon, right? Yeah. But don't be surprised if you wake up one day and find out that the South Carolina state legislature passed a law that said you can no longer practice traditional African spirituality without a degree from an accredited university and a license from the state board. It's coming. White people right now are in the process of mastering the information enough for them to create a college program from it. Once they, can, once they feel they have enough information to now offer a degree at the University of South Carolina in traditional African spirituality, they're going to make it illegal for you to practice it. It's coming, and it's our fault because we don't believe in keeping anything all black. It's coming. I got invited to, Har to Brooklyn, New York City, for a voodoo ceremony Bwa Kwa Iman, that's the place where Book Mandala led the voodoo ceremony that triggered the Haitian Revolution. I go to Brooklyn, I'm like, damn, voodoo ceremony, they want Dr. Umar to speak, Haitian Revolution, it's August 21st, I'm there. I get there, and it's a damn cracker woman running the whole damn thing. I said, Jean-Jacques Dessalines is turning over in his grave. And then I find out from the black folk that the white lady that runs the voodoo thing in Brooklyn... She's the highest ranking voodoo person on paper from a political perspective in the city. Not through the training, but on paper. She's the one that people go through to get things done with the city. So she's power broking Haitian voodoo for personal profit. They have white guys doing the drum, some rhythmless ass white voodoo dances. Shit almost scared me. Brothers and sisters, we got to stop letting people misappropriate our culture. We have to stop doing that. You can't, I never thought I'd see the day. I was in New Orleans. So now let's go to New Orleans voodoo. I'm down in New Orleans shopping at some of the voodoo shops or what have you. There's a white dude in one of the voodoo shops, and he started breaking down to me how the top uh, New Orleans voodoo uh, mamba is personally tutoring him in a New Orleans voodoo. And how he's being taught by the best. And it's a cracker man. Learning all the secrets of our ancestors. And we just giving them away to anybody who can afford to pay for it. We better stop. We better stop. Integration is a form of insanity. And it is way out of hand, brothers and sisters. We got to put it into it. So to answer your question is witchcraft now. But it's going to be a money maker in about two decades if we keep on selling it to them. Whatever white people cannot control and whatever they cannot exploit, they would rather destroy it or treat it like it's evil. They've done that with everything in the world. And why do they hate traditional African spirituality? Because it's decentralized. See, the reason they outlawed traditional African spirituality and, 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 and made you go to church and made you go to the mosque is because in the church and the mosque, there's an identified leader who can control the message and the behavior. African spirituality, although we do things in a group, a lot of it is self-directed individual work. So if your ancestors is talking to you, the government cannot control that. You got to remember, this is the same system that triggered the Haitian Revolution. So white folks are dead, scared of any black person talking about voodoo, except the white people practicing it. And they only want to, 
and the only one to study it and practice it and master it so they can stop you from participating in it. Because guess what? Even though they can participate in voodoo, they don't have your ashe. See, hey. see, people can study our systems. They can study our systems and master our systems intellectually, but they can never go to the depth of spiritual experience that you can because you are original man and woman. You understand? See, the science of the Buddhists is the science of Africa taken to India. The lotus flower is not indigenous to India. It's indigenous to Africa. So that lets you know it was taken there. And even though they can meditate and they can do all of that, nobody can outdo you like you can do you. You understand? So even though you see all these new world spiritualists and new age this and Chinese and Arabs and, and white folks uh, bringing all this new age, that ain't new age. That's old age African magic that they call a new age spirituality. New age spirituality is nothing but old age African spirituality, but they don't want to give us credit. So they steal all of our ancestor spiritual technology and put a different name on it. Mm -hmm. Remember the white man's definition of power, the ability to define reality and make everybody accept it. Mm -hmm. Who's my number two? Yes, sir. All right, so the question that I have is just to try to put it simple, what would be the number one thing that you think that we would be able to do and applying the principles of Pan-Africanism and Garveyism to improve the conditions in our communities right now. Education and economics. That means build a school for the children and pool our money together so we can build institutions and put people to work. See, when we talk about institutionalization, and an institution like the family is the basis of nation, right? When we talk about institutionalization, you got to employ people to operate and run and function the institution. So with every institution comes employment. We need something that we can call our own. That's the question for Columbia. What is the first institution that we need in your city? It will probably be a school, even if it's a homeschool network, which is something I talk about in my book. If you're homeschooling your kids, please read my chapter on homeschooling because a lot of parents are messing it up. Like you got to make sure when you homeschool your child, you have a dedicated schedule and a dedicated time period in each day that the child gets homeschooled. So if you're going to homeschool, from 8 to 12, and I think 4 hours is enough, 5 is good, if you want to do 6 or more, you can, but 4 to 5 is good per day, at least 4 hours, a, at least 4 days a week, but you got to make sure you protect those 4 hours. I see homeschool parents running errands, going to the store during the 4 hours, checking email, tweeting and Facebooking and TikToking and taking visitors in your home. That's not homeschooling. If you are a homeschool teacher, them 4 hours are sacred. You don't answer a phone. You don't open the door. You don't check an email. You are totally focused on your child. A lot of us are not taking it serious enough, and then we're telling people, yeah, I homeschool my child four hours a day. No, you don't. You're homeschooling four minutes a day, okay? <laughs> you have, if you're not a disciplined parent, you will not be an effective homeschool parent. Some of y'all work in two and three jobs talking about you homeschooling. Impossible because you have no time for instruction, which is why I think parents should work together and create homeschool networks. And in the book, I talk a little bit about how you can do that. But also, once FDMG is up and running, I plan on starting a national homeschool network to be tied into the school for children who cannot physically go to the school. But we're also going to build a distance learning platform for FDMG so your child can still be in Columbia, South Carolina and still be tapped into the class where the classmates can see him, he can see the classmates and teachers, still get his instruction, but he will be required to come to the campus four times a year to build relationship with his brothers and sisters because we are forging lifelong bonds for our students. And ladies, I'm not leaving the girls out, okay? After three to five years of having a boys' school open, we will be opening the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy for the young African princesses as well. But I do want to be clear, your daughter must have natural hair to go to my school. She cannot be weaved, she cannot be turned, she cannot be straightened. If her hair ain't natural, she can't come to the school. And ladies, if you want to work at the school, your hair has to be natural as well. And if you want to send a resume in, the email address for resumes is FDMG Resumes with an S, R-E-S-U-M-E-S, -E FDMG Resumes at gmail.com. When you send in your resume, please include a cover letter just telling me who you are and why you think you will be a good fit for the school and also a photo. All right? It's okay if you're not natural now, sisters, as long as you're natural when you show the hell up at my school. Okay? All right. Education and economics. Who am I number three? Yes, ma'am. Mostly, do you think that this is 
a goal that is in alignment with our economic <clears throat> liberation. I what mean, type of tech are they doing? Um, it, it will be sales, it will be customer success, it will be... I say why not, and the reason why I say why not is because I look back at some of the jobs I had early in life, right? I worked at a daycare center, I worked at a sneaker store, I worked in a warehouse, and it was some of those jobs that motivated me to not want to do that for the rest of my life, which is why I went back to college and took my education so seriously. So sometimes those menial experiences are what our young people need to decide that that's not what they want to do forever. So I say go for it. We all got to crawl before we can walk. I don't have a problem with it. All right. Who's my number four? Were you number four? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Since I see you manifesting the works of John Henry Clark mm -hmm. and his honorable Elijah Muhammad in your new school, mm -hmm. are you going to implement, and I'm, I have to make a referral to uh, race war, uh -huh. right? You're inputting race war with Professor Kava Hiawatt. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking of your implementation of the school, which you put in the virtual comedic school of science that uh, I think Reverend Timothy Shop Matthews and uh, Professor Kava Hiawatha mm -hmm. and Dr. Claude Anderson and a few other brothers have implemented. I was thinking, would you implement that into your course? Okay. I don't think that they each have their own platform that they're working on. I don't right. think they're all in one together. But yes, there will be aspects of what some of those scholars you just mentioned named that will be put in the school. So when you deal with a Dr. Claude Anderson, an extension to that as a Pan-Africanist will be Dr. Amos Wilson, right? Mm -hmm. right. And you mentioned the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but of course, he borrowed everything Marcus Garvey taught. So I don't need right. to teach Elijah Muhammad because I'm teaching the person who taught Elijah Muhammad, right. and that's the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Right. Okay, so... Uh, I would just take everyone you mentioned to the Pan-African source for me because I'm a Pan-Africanist and bring that right on over. But without question, I'll ap unapologetically African, absolutely. Um, so, yes. And we also, next year, the night of the awards, excuse me, the night of the FDMG Fest, Saturday, September 10th, 2022, and I want to see all y'all there for that. It's free. Uh, we will be having the first annual unapologetically African awards which you guys can also register for. That's going to be the night of the fest. So the fest will go to like 6, and the Unapologetically African Awards are going to be from like 7 to midnight. There's going to be a dinner, performers, awards, dancing. It's a black tie affair or African formal. Okay, so ladies, you get to dress up. Um, we're going to honor the ancestors. Excuse me, honor the elders this year because I'm tired of us waiting till our elders die, and then we want to honor them after the fact. Give them their flowers here. So the first annual Unapologetically African Awards will be dedicated to honoring black excellence in the form of our elders and their contributions to us. So y'all might not want to miss that because we're going to have all the elders in one place. Unfortunately, I really wished that Baba Renoko Rashid, uh, another fellow Garveyite scholar, I wish I could have honored him as well. Um, he's actually the first scholar of note that I shared the stage with when I was still back in the Garvey movement back in 2004, North Carolina Central at the UNIA Regional Conference. And he's gone now because he took the COVID shot, that Baba Renoko took the COVID shot, and he died during his trip in Kemet this past summer. So yeah, Renoko was gone, COVID. Uh, I also believe Colin Powell uh, succumbed to the COVID. We know Cicely Tyson succumbed to the COVID. We know Marvelous Marvin Hagler succumbed to the COVID. We know Hank Aaron succumbed to the COVID. We know DMX took the shot and could have also likely succumbed to the COVID. Bottom line, if you are 60 years of age or older, you have no business taking that shot because I am convinced it is toxic to elder Africans, and I believe it was designed to be toxic to elder Africans. And I'm going to tell you something else. This new shot that they want you to give your child for COVID, the baby COVID, you're out of your mind if you're going to put that thing in your baby's body. These people are engineering us to be sexually impotent and infertile. They want to stop black folks from reproducing, and they're more motivated than ever because 25 of the 50 American states have a zero birth population for white folks. That means in half this country, more white people are dying than being born. 
I hope y'all know this. If you don't believe me, Google it. The Associated Press reported this. So this was not fake news. This came from the AP. 25 states have a zero population growth for white people. More dying than being born. And I think that also helps explain a lot of the uh, uh, macro aggressions that we're experiencing from white folks because they're so pissed off. They've been trying to get rid of African life for 50 years and they're really getting rid of their own. So you understand me? So that, that's the scourge of the earth. That's the divinities working. You keep messing with my children, we're going to mess with you back. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, let's not fall into the trap that a lot of our Christian and Muslim brothers fall into. Not all of them, but some of them into believing that the war is for God to fight. The war is not for God to fight. The war is for us to fight. Because if you know of a war that was ever fought by God, I'd like to know when and where that was fought. You're going to have to fight this. So let us be clear. Spirituality is an aid. Our ancestors are an aid. Our intelligence is an aid. Our diet is an aid. But the war got to be fought by you. Marcus Garvey said it best. People die in war and they're going to die. The problem is not that we die. The problem is we wait so long to replace those who have died. Mm -hmm. Malcolm been dead almost 60 years. No replacement for Malcolm. King been dead almost 60 years. No replacement for King. Garvey been dead 80 years. No replacement for Garvey. One of the biggest mistakes we make as a people is we pray for our leaders. Everybody else makes theirs. Mm -hmm. Chinese, they make leaders. The white man, they make leaders. The Jews, they make leaders. Black people want to pray for the leadership. Stop praying for leaders and start making your leaders, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do. Who's my number five? five. <laughs> Me right here. Yeah. Okay. Go right ahead. I practice remembrance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so sir. my question is, is kind of truthful in nature. I haven't done it in a while. I want to let you know I'm pleased to meet you. Likewise. But um, I want to ask you about the Michigan Sovereignty Commission. I don't know if you know anything about it. I'm not it. familiar. Okay, the Tell Michigan me. Sovereignty Commission was created by the FBI and the CIA mm. to deter any civil rights movements that would happen back when King was okay. alive and doing all of They were the ones having people killed. Okay. But when they ran out of technology, they started using black coons as you put it. Mm -hmm. Because it, the technology going to take them so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had to get coons that were actually being involved with Martin Luther King and all these different Martin people to get hand on information. Yes, sir. And his and his his not to control, his photographer was one of the yep. main undercover and FBI the preacher, agents. Doctor King's the photographer, the picture taker was the agent. And the preacher that was, that was in the background, you see, he was yeah. one of the main ones, too. But this is my question. Now, out of concern, I, it's kind of a rhetorical question, because I want to ask you, what do all those leaders have in common? And I guess you would say they all got killed. They were all uh -huh. murdered. So my question is, you know, I don't want to see you get hurt. I don't want to see you die. But it's just like you just said, mm -hmm. our leaders come along so few and far between that we need protection for them. Mm -hmm. We need protection for you. You know, how many Umars are gonna come along if something were to happen to you? Mm -hmm. you, know, you see what I'm saying? So, um, my question is, are you planning on, you know, I know you talked about the kids learning karate and all that kind of stuff, but do you have any plans to protect yourself, mm -hmm. to keep you around, to keep this movement going? Right. Because that's, that's the bottom line. Don't take but one way ever to get rid of you. And then we got to start all over from scratch. Good question. Mm -hmm. Good Great question. A uh, couple thoughts on that. Great question, by the way, Bob. Number one, uh, when I travel, I normally have security meet me at the different places. There's a few brothers in here who got my back that nobody know they I share. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I do have security when I travel. The reason I have not graduated to a full-time security like you see with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is you have to be careful about full-time security unless you're ready to have that forever. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you saw Dr. Umar with full-time security all the time, and then you saw me alone, I look naked and vulnerable like that. Mm -hmm. You see, it's like if you saw the minister walking down the street, going to the store, you're like, oh my God, where's the security at? Because they have become a part of this public persona. I'm not ready for that yet. And one of the reasons I'm not ready for that yet is in the study of the assassination of our heroes, the ones you spoke of, most of them were set up from within the security inner circle. Yeah, yeah. Almost every one. And that's my concern with them, right? It was the inner circle that took out uh, 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 Malcolm, you know, uh, uh, according to Dr. King's family attorney, William Pepper. He said in his book, uh, the, the Assassination of Martin Luther King, you all need to read it, 
that Jesse Jackson provided intelligence to the FBI that helped lead to uh, Dr. King's assassination. Jesse Jackson called off the invaders, which were a local uh, grassroots security detail that came to secure Dr. King, and Jesse told them they wasn't needed, and Dr. King was dead within less than an hour. You see, so you gotta be careful about that inner circle, and, and, and the reason I say that is because that ego of the Negro, we're so incised to be jealous and envious. And you just never know when the brother right next to you gonna switch. Cause I've been through that. I've had brothers who I thought would be me to the day that I died. They just wake up one day and they got tired of the love I got. They just got tired of it and flipped them. And I'm like, damn, I thought you'd have been there in the end. Everybody not strong enough to stand next to you. That's what's yeah. true, man. You, you got to have people who stand next to you who they above pettiness, they above jealousy. Can't no woman whisper in their ear at night and tell them nothing. Can't no brother in the hood flip them against you. You need people who are above being turned into traitors. And that's hard to find. It's very hard to find. You know, but I always say all the time, you know, I say if I could live life over again, if somebody would have came to me back in college and said, listen, in 2010, you're going to go from here to here, make sure you're ready. Two things I would have made sure I had, or I would have tried to make sure I had them, was one, a group of brothers and sisters I could trust to do the work, and two, a wife that I could trust to do the work. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that I have been missing in this journey. Had I had it at the beginning, I know I would be further than where I am. But then I also got to look at the wisdom that those ancestors brought forth through their example, and I think sometimes we're meant to walk it alone. I don't know why, but almost everyone had to walk it alone. And even when they had a team with them, they were still alone in that circle, you know? But I agree with you, it's time to change it. But most importantly, because to a large extent, I believe that day, whenever it's supposed to come for me, is already set, so I don't pay it too much mind. But what is not set is the replacements that need to come when I go. When we all go, and that's why the FDMG Academy is so important for me, because they are the replacement. It's a whole generation of black men who know what to do, how to do it, and willing to give their life to it. But great, very good question, very good question. Who my number six? Great question, Bob. Six, see, I didn't fail, see? Who wants six? I'm giving up six. Free six. We got the real six? Go ahead, Bob. of it and I've seen it. They devalue the property when it's in black hands and then they overvalue the property when it's in white hands. Right. First of all, we got to recognize that this whole mm -hmm. gentrification movement started with the election of uh, President George W. Bush in the year 2000. That's when the white power structure decided that they were going to purge the inner cities of all black people. Remember, most black, most of the white folks never wanted to leave Columbia, South Carolina anyway. You understand? They left when we came, but they never relinquished their control of the real estate. And so now they want to come back. And what they do is they like to keep us as property owners. So when, they, excuse me, as renters, not property owners. So when they do decide to come back, it's so easy to push us out the way. But this takes me to another conversation on reparations. And I believe that one of the reparations items that should be on our list of demands is a return to African people. All the land that was stolen illegally from our ancestors between 1865 and 1965, we lost tens of thousands of acres, not legally, we didn't sell it, the bank didn't repossess it, crackers came and threatened our great, great, great grandparents to get off that land or they were going to take their lives. There's a lot of land you walk on every day that is black owned, but we don't even know it. So we need a research team to start researching the stolen lands because we keep talking about we want America to give us land. How about... Make America give you back the land that was taken. You may already have enough to build your own independent community. So on my list of reparations, one is the land. But another reason why I want to go to law school, my brother, is because I want to become an expert as well in land law too. Because I know exactly what you're talking about. I even get emails from brothers and sisters who talk about how they're being swindled out of land. 
you understand, and land being devalued and this and that. And I also think our brothers and sisters who are realtors need to do a better job of educating the community too. So many of them are so hell-bent on making a hustle that they're not doing no education. You know what I mean? I don't understand it. Everybody I meet is a realtor, but when are you going to teach the people some of these little tricks they need to know to hold on to their property? But you do got a couple organizations out there that's doing that type of thing too. But that was a very good point. Also on the reparations list, I think we need to demand control of all black music. Okay, because black music is America's second leading export. If we control the publishing and the distribution and the performing and the sales of black music, that would give us all the billions we need to build black Wall Streets all across America. I want Michael Jackson music. I want Prince music. You understand? I want Whitney. I want Sam Cooke. If we control black music, that in and of itself would empower us. But please don't fall into this trap of equating reparations with dollars and cents. Because that's the trap that Bob Johnson fell into, the former owner of BET, who said, according to his calculations, every American African is owed $350,000, which to me is a big-ass damn joke. Because if you're trying to reduce 400 years of the dehumanization of my ancestors to $350,000, you'd have lost your mind. How much is a nice house in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina? How much? 150 to 200000 one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand. About two fifty, right? So if you get three fifty, that's a house and a car. <laughs> my reparations, all the hell my ancestors went through, house and a car. We don't want money because America's money doesn't have any worth to it. Remember that. Taking money for reparations is a trap. His money has no worth. We should be going for resources and for assets and for control of things, not for no money. I want black music, I want black inventions, I want black land, and I want control of the major port in the 10 cities where African Americans dominate, which include what? Uh, California, Illinois, Florida, Virginia, mm -hmm. is South Carolina mm -hmm. one? Georgia. 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 Georgia is one, Texas is one, but there's 10 states that make up more than 60% of the African American population. All of those states are on water, seaboarding states. We should own the major port in each of those states because you control what come in, you control what go out, and most of all you get paid for it all. Right. And lastly, in case a race war does kick off and we got to get the hell up out of here, we got the ships already waiting to get us up out of here. But I really think that's how we're supposed to be thinking. My problem with the reparation struggle is most of the people arguing reparations are not visionary enough. I keep hearing about money. What the hell are we talking about money for? All you can do with money is give it away. And as long as black people don't have no infrastructure, if they gave you money today, Mercedes would be rich tomorrow. Korean hair would be rich tomorrow. I don't want money as a trap. We want assets and control the resources. That's the way we're supposed to be thinking. But I also want to say this. Anybody who is dating, married to, engaged to, or making babies with aliens don't get no reparations. You do not get a payout at all. Okay? And one of the reasons you don't get a payout... Is because when you die, my ancestors' reparation goes to a damn devil, and I'm not going to allow that. So if you want to make babies with Betsy, be my guest, but you ain't getting none of the reparations pie. And I mean it. Uh, number seven. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sister. Uh, I have a question in regards to uh, social and or emotional learning. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what kind of so practical social and or emotional learning strategies or activities can be implemented in the schools first and foremost as a mm -hmm. teacher and also in the household and again I stress practical because you know with our lives that go to go hustle to hustle you know we need some practical things to instill some sort of familiar values in the home great question queen two responses to that number one as African people social and emotional learning is so inherent to who we are naturally that unlike other groups, we may not have to always program specifically for it because it's who we are. The other thing, it's hard to give a prescription without knowing the children involved. You know, it's like somebody said, give me a treatment plan for depression. I work with somebody with depression, give me a treatment plan. I can't without knowing their situation because if everybody in here got depression, but we don't know have depression for, diff for different reasons. I'm depressed because my wife left me. He depressed because he don't know his dad. She depressed because she just got fired. She depressed because she kicked a drinking habit and picked up a, 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 a bottle of alcohol after two months, and now she uh, disappointed at herself. Just because you got the same diagnosis don't mean you got the same cause for the diagnosis, so it's the same thing. 
I really got to know a little bit more. But if you took my contact info, if you reach out to me, I definitely have a conversation with you and, and give you some ideas. Thank you. Great, great question there. Now, who's my number eight? Last but not least, yes, sir. Peace and black power, family. Black power. Right. I'm Brother Shabazz, and this is my brother Notch Harris. I just want right. to, you know, give, extend my hand to uh, some sisters that maybe want to purchase your book. Okay. We're about six oh, books. And, uh, uh, just who less fortunate, you know, folks, queens. I want to purchase six. Uh, me and my my bro here purchase books. You know, to give you. Uh, I appreciate that. So my single mothers, six books. You better get to that, brother. All right? Say that fit. Yeah, I appreciate that, brother. That was very generous of you. I'll take two more, and then I think I should start signing the books and taking the photos. Let me go with the elder and Baba, Queen Mother. Right. Greetings, Baba. It's Greetings, good to Queen see Mother. you Likewise, again. likewise. Oh. It's been six yes. and a half six, years. Six and a half years. I'm 69. God willing, I will see You look seven. 29. Black don't crack. <laughs> Peace and honor. Um, my question is, and as you know, I'm a behavioral scientist. Oh, I'm an right. urban anthropologist. And I went to University of Penn. So you know oh, I'm a little Philly. twisted. All right. Philly. Um, the martial arts as opposed to the martial sciences. Mm -hmm. Self-defense as opposed to self-preservation. Mm. I've done the African martial sciences, and you know, sir, for the last 50 years. Yes, ma'am. But still, with all the traveling going around, if one more person says Bruce Lee, hi <laughs> to me, I will absolutely uh, lose uh, my mind. We are the number one <laughs> group who elevate every Body type else. of yeah. fighting system except our own and they will have a picture of an Asian instructor in the people Africans had karate no they didn't have karate how do you feel about because I had I was on a zoom I'm not gonna take any more time I was on a zoom and my question to the Asian and Caucasian <laughs> instructors, mm -hmm. is it possible, is it possible for a black African to ever reach the level that the white or the Asian has reached in their system? Mm -hmm. Didn't get an answer. Mm -hmm. Not an answer at all. Why do we study Okay, Black Panther movie, great, but it was make believe. Mm -hmm. The young man who played that role, I believe they took him out of I here. I believe they did too. Because he was getting ready to speak of the fact, the Japanese and the, the, the great warrior. Why do we hold on to this? We will talk about Bruce Lee all the time. Yet the man who punched Bruce Lee in the face four times, Victor Moore, people don't even know about the brother. Mm -hmm. And he's like 93. I've mm. only done African martial sciences. Mm. I've lived on six and seven continents, and Africa, they fight. I don't want to hear about Capoeira. <laughs> it came from the Angolo, mm. Central Africa. So why are we still holding on to this? Is it the image thing? It's the image thing. Okay. It's also the ignorance it. thing. <laughs> it's the image thing, but it's also the ignorance thing as well. Okay. You know, but to the question you raised, can black people achieve the highest right. level of perfection in another science? Yes, the sir. question is yes, because almost all those sciences, sciences. are corrupted versions of the African science yes, anyway. Sir. I was in, uh, when I, last time I was invited to speak in Asia by the Africans over there. Japan. Uh, I was in Japan and I was in China. And when I was in Japan, mm -hmm. or was it China? One of them, we went to a, a Dao De Jing temple. Right. Okay. And we also went to like a martial arts museum. Right. And so when I got up close, because I wanted to see myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I get up close on these images. And when you go into the back, the old dusty rooms and... Right. The images of the uh, 
the fathers of the Dao De Jing, they were all black men. They were all black men. They had the phenotype of the Asian, but the lips was broad, the nose was broad, the hair was nappy, yeah. they had afros. Mm -hmm. You know, they looked like a, 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 a show enough, if you will. Right. Okay? Right. So those people know that we're the originators of it yes, all. Sir. You know what I mean? Because even in their art, yes. they hide it, but you can still find it. Find we it. went to this one old Buddhist temple. This was Japan. And they had all these Buddhist statues, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, I know it's some black ones. So I kept on looking and kept on digging. And then when I got to the oldest ones, mm -hmm. they were unapologetically African. Mm -hmm. Like you could not right. mistake them for yes, being a modern Japanese or a modern Chinese. Here's the question. We've been so convinced that we were not great that I think a lot of us are too afraid to embrace our greatness because it's foreign to us. And that which you don't know, even if it's a good thing, can sometimes be scary. Which is why I think Mr. Garvey said we have to convince the black man of his own greatness and sell him back to himself. Which is to say we need a new cultural renaissance. Like We literally have to promote and promulgate the, the greatness of African culture. We need a right. literary renaissance. We right. need a cultural renaissance. We need a black family renaissance. We need a spiritual mm -hmm. renaissance. Like, if you think about it, what aspects of black art do you see on display right. for the world, but mostly for our own selves? You don't see it. Now, they're always talking about gangster rap and, you right. know, sports and athletics, which I don't really consider that culture too right. much. That's all they push. Right. But when it comes to the intellectual aspects of our culture, the, the writing, the, uh, the art, you don't really see that on display yeah. as much as you should. And I think we really need to have a renaissance. Sell it back to one another. One of the things, and I don't mean financially, I mean right. culturally. Yes, one sir. of the things we want to do with FDMG is we're going to bring back the Marcus Garvey Drama Club. One of the things that Garvey did back in his time in New York City, they had the UNIA Garvey Club, the uh, excuse me, Literary Society and um, Dramatic Society. And they would put on plays about great African ancestors and great African events. I think we need to go back to the stage plays. I can't right. remember the last time I got invited to a play that wasn't dealing with some black-on-black -black right. relationship conflict. Are y'all following me? Because mm -hmm. almost every play I see is about black-on-black -black relationship conflict, yes. male, mm -hmm. female, reality, housewife type of nonsense. Yes. Yes. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to start putting plays back on. Let's put Sojourner Truth in a play. Let's put the Haitian Revolution in a play. Let's put the Mau Mau in a play. Now, when I was in Atlanta the other day, you know, I drove past the Tyler Perry Studios thing. Gigantic, enormous, beautiful. And I'm trying to understand why this brother, with all this money and all this intelligence, and all you want to do is make these buffoonery movies about black folks. I'm like, even if you got it, I understand he might got to keep on putting some of that out because that's what black folks want to see. That's what pays your bills. That's what built your studio, bro. But every once in a while, can you hit us with something relevant? Every once in a while, can we get a movie on the Honorable Marcus Garvey? Every once in a while, you understand, can you dramatize the life and times of Ida B. Wells? I mean, if you're going to do a Medea for every Medea you do, give us something that's culturally relevant. I don't understand these people. You know, I even look at 50 Cent, very intelligent guy. But you can be a meth. Uh, a right. power book three, power book four. Can you give me something other than drugs and crime? Because yeah. it's clear you're a genius. Well, Ice Cube, same thing with the barbershop joints. You know what I mean? And they do be having some good messages, messages. in them. But then it'd be some cooning right next to the good message. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the last barbershop, the situation culminated where his son finally cut his locks off. And that meant he was ready to grow up and be a responsible man. What the hell was that? You know, so a lot of them brothers, you know, I need them to turn the corner. Because they're not providing culturally stimulating a uh, 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 content, and that's what we need. But if I'm gonna talk about them, I gotta talk about the YouTubians too, because you get on Black YouTube, 99% of all Black YouTube is toxic. I'm not seeing serious conversations. I'm not seeing serious research. I see a lot of he say, she say, character assassination debate, Black male female conflict situations. You mean to tell me everybody has the ability to project their message to the world, and we're using it to degrade one another? Sad, queens. Um, greetings, Dr. Greetings, I'm greetings. so grateful that you came. Thank you. Um, I'm from Baltimore, but I retired to come down to South Carolina. I oh. love Columbia. And um, I'm a dancer. The same, yeah, same. we're in the arts. Oh. I'm an African dancer. And uh, the challenge I'm having is my sisters, they won't come to the classes. Because sometimes there's something about African dance, it's like it's a fearfulness mm -hmm. uh, with doing mm -hmm. the movement. But we're not just moving the body. 
it brings assertiveness to us. It makes us feel good. It makes us yeah. feel good about women. I don't. I speak mm. about that. Mm. The dance is the movement, but it's. I do the West African because that's all we got. You know, the brothers came from Senegal to Baltimore to teach. That's what I learned, wow. and wow. in D.C. But um, African dance is something that I hope the sisters would uh, get into because we're losing it. Yes. And the white women in Colorado and Utah and Arizona, they got that thing. But the thing that I see, they don't have the soul. Because when the sisters get up there and we do our solos and we get up, we bad. And not even have any experience in African dance. So I'm asking the sisters to be more open to the children when we give African dance because there's another sister here who's a teacher. And so we want to embrace, we want you all to embrace African dance so that uh, we can teach the women not just the movement, but to feel good about self mm -hmm. and to stand tall and know mm -hmm. that you're beautiful mm -hmm. from the inside. That's what I wanted to say. And Dr. Umar, I thank you because you remind me of the brothers back when I was a young girl. I was a teenager and the Panthers was around me. Mm -hmm. And they were strong black men. And I've said this in another lecture years ago, here in Columbia, that the black man has lost something. They're not as strong as they used to be. I see the black man, I, I feel, you know, I go to Africa to sometimes get my dates and things. I go to Ghana. <laughs> I'm getting ready to head over to Nigeria to explore other black men. Because something has happened to the black man in America, and it hurts my heart. Y'all have lost something. Mm. I can't pinpoint it. So when I hear Dr. Umar, I know you're a man, you have issues, because mm -hmm. you're human. But you're a strong black man, and I'm grateful to know you. And I, you, you uh, did a lecture at the school where I was a school secretary <coughs> with Dr. Uh, Haki at Sam Yacoa's Tale in Baltimore and Pennsylvania Avenue in Preston. That's that when you first blizzard? started. Was you were first blizzard? started on the surf. Was it a snowstorm that day? Yes. And First you came out. There was a few Ooh. people around. I drove in the snow down Yes, there. Dr. Umar, and I had no idea you would grow to this level. So I still pray that you will be safe. Every time Thank you're on you. YouTube, I pray for your safety you. and the love that you have for other people. And I think that you're a beautiful human being. And Thank you, you will have me. the school. And I hope that I can do at least one, donate at least one week of African dance to my children. Because wow. my children are all over the world. We're just that powerful as women. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You know, and that's well all said. I wanted to say well about said. that. Thank you. Last one, my brother. Perfect city. And what she's talking about is manhood training. Manhood training needs to be taught in our community. And we don't have to worry about someone talking about they trying to take out him. Because they won't have to worry about which earth that we're going to scorch if you take out any of ours. Mm, mm, mm. That's the thing. So I'm going to tell you right now, something would pop off right now. I'm willing to die. I share. To protect. Amen. Huh? Amen. And every man in here should be ready to do the same. Amen. Any given day of the week. And that's, and that's anything, anytime, the communities right now. After this pandemic, I've seen so much crime. Our youth, our babies out there killing each other. Y'all look at the news room. Mm. That has to stop. Mm. I saw some brothers, I don't know where they were from, but they went into the schools because they had this giant school, high school fight. And these brothers got together and went to the schools and they are taking shifts on being there. Mm -hmm. Hey, greeting the kids when they come in, walk around the school, talking to the young brothers, making sure they quiet that down and they haven't had an incident since. Mm -hmm. We need to do the same thing wherever you are around here. We can't blame these youth because you ain't showing them what a real man supposed to look. That's right. That's right. They haven't seen a real man in years. That's right. You got to stand on yours. Our women are unprotected. Because when that thing, oh, I got to admit, when you ask that question, it just burns something in me. I did, oh, wait a minute. That ain't the question. No, no, no. 
If you put your hand on him, that's gonna be who we gonna oh my god. <laughs> they got to dare touch anything on one of ours. That's why they're killing our young men in the streets, because they think they have no consequences. Man. I let them, I let politicians, I let judicial I let police, everybody know if you touch me and mine and anything I'm around, oh God. Ain't no one going to stop you, Pastor Pope Chop, or none of them. <laughs> I'm willing to take that L, because I will die for what I believe in. Each right. one of y'all, I will die on the spot for y'all. And every man needs to take that pledge right now. This is what we're going to do, brothers and sisters. For all the sisters who would like to take a picture or get a book signed, you're going to form a line on this side of the table, right? And all the brothers, we're going to form a line that way, okay? And I'm going to go lady, brother, lady, brother, to make sure we maintain the balance. If anybody want to get a copy of the book, Sister Charnette has them in the back there, okay? But uh, brothers and sisters, stay in touch with me. I want to see y'all September 10th, 2022. You have my number. And I totally enjoyed your company today. Okay, uh, ladies, don't forget, this is the brother giving out six books, six books for free. Are you coming through? 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 Are